this thing on.
morning. Welcome to the board meeting of December 1st, 2015, calling it to order at uh, about 9.12. This morning, uh, I'm uh, board chair Felicia Marcus. To my left, vice chair Fran Spivey Weber. To her left, board member Didi Diadamo. To my right, board member Tam Dodak. And to her right, board member Stephen Moore. Mr. Howard, will you introduce the staff that's assisting today? Thank you. To my left, Chief Counsel Michael Laufer. To my right, Chief, Chief Deputies John Bishop and Karen Turgovich. And assisting the board are Janine Townsend and Courtney De Tyler. Um, for those of you who don't know our emergency evacuation procedures, please take a look and find the exit nearest you. If you hear an emergency sound, take your stuff, take your friends, walk uh, carefully out of the building. We gather near the corner of um, 10th and J. If you want to wait with us, you'll know when the all clear comes to come back. Um, the other thing to know is when you come up to the microphone, it's important to speak uh, closely enough to it that it's picked up so the people who are listening over the web can hear you, but not so close as to have it pop, which is um, disconcerting for folks who are listening. Um, what else? Oh, and if you have uh, noisemakers of any kind, please put them on silent or stun. Just a reminder. We should have a video, kind of like when you go to the movie theater. That's a really clever thing about turning your cell phone on. Yeah, or we could have previews. How about previews of the meeting? That'd be kind of fun. Um, all right, now we're on to... Um, oh, if popcorn, it's okay? All right. Make it so. No, only kidding. Um, uh, the first item uh, will be the presentation of Superior Accomplishment Awards. Always wonderful. First off, says that Christine Gordon is going to be presenting. But you're not Christine Gordon. But it's delightful that you'll be presenting. Yes, I think it is delightful. Christine <laughs> set it all up for me, so. Uh, I'm presenting today to Stephanie Louis. Come up here so I can embarrass you the whole time I'm talking. So DFA has been accused of uh, becoming an empire. Not my fault. Is it just that $2 billion that you have? To it's spend? the $2 billion. It's the merger of the Division of Drinking Water, uh, financial folks. Um, we've added like 175 people. So we're pretty close to 300 in the division now. Um, I wish I could take credit for that. But um, when you're adding that many people, you have to have a top notch personnel person. And Stephanie, is that for the division? Uh, I think this is an old count. Last count was 118 actual personnel packages she's processed. How many now? She doesn't even know. We don't even want to count it now. So um, of that 175, you can imagine how that is. Um, she came in in uh, 2014, <coughs> hit the ground running with uh, like a mountain of workload. And then not only did that and process it so effectively that she made improvements along the way. And that to me signifies when you can be really proud of an employee and how they're doing. So uh, we're all super impressed with Stephanie. Um, I do have one complaint though. She hires the employees faster than I can remember their names. I now only know probably, well, maybe half of my division. And after this, I'm gonna go over Walk. to Byron Share and have an all staff meeting and see how many more I can memorize today. So, so Stephanie, thank you very much. It's really appreciated. Um, a small token of our graduate. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, one more, Greg and Rich, you want to come up? Good morning. I'm Greg Gearhart, uh, Deputy Director, Office of Information Management Analysis. This is the, uh, the swamp transition uh, team. And so the story is, um, as you know, there's, uh, we're celebrating 13 years of amazing swamp data trends coming in this year. Um, the swamp uh, was built on the swamp program is the ambient monitoring program. And it was built on a highly um, detailed collaborative partnership model. And um, over the years, it, it grew and it became incredibly successful at uh, incorporating other people's resources and help to sort of make the program successful. In 2013, the program was faced with an incredible challenge, though, of transitioning uh, to comply with uh, civil service guidelines and policies associated with contracting and making sure that we, we have um, compliance with those uh, general orders and directives. And so um, there was a challenge, and, and an ultimatum was laid down. Basically, the small program was told, you have one more round of a master contract approach business model and it was uh, essentially using two master contracts and they had one more they were given one more round with the promise that they would uh, transition the model to comply with the directives and so uh, a team was formed and it was rich and karen that really did all the work rich and karen uh, larson rich brewer and karen larson and the team basically went through uh, a complex process of writing a proposal to change the business model to change from two contracts to um, 11 um, plus, and, and also in-house in a lot of the services. So it's pulling, extracting out not only the center tent pole from this model, but pulling out some of the services and making them civil servant jobs at the water board. And so the team that's up here now is um, really the, the proof that we did that in a two-year period of time. And so when I came on board, the transition was almost done. So my role is, is to sort of just observe the amazing work done by the others. But um, Rich and Karen really led the effort, but part of the effort uh, required hiring new people to, to uh, transition this model. And so we had a contract team that was formed by Chad, uh, Chad Fearing and uh, Jennifer Salisbury were the two contract team members. And then the other uh, job was to hire staff that were going to come along and provide these civil service uh, functions that were um, previously contracted out. And so Lori Weber was already on board. Um, and she was part of the team of hiring some of the scientists and in-housing some of these services and helping the contracts transform, as well as Melissa Morris was hired from Region 5 to sort of run the QA program for the whole SWAMP program, which was previously outsourced. And then Calvin was one of the master um, uh, uh, liaisons between all these functions and services. So he's a scientist, uh, Melissa's a scientist, Jennifer's a scientist, um, Lori's a scientist, and Chad is a as an analyst, but this team really had to sort of blend all their functions to make this uh, a successful transition. And it was not, as you can imagine, change is not a popular thing amongst uh, stakeholders, both internal and external. There was a lot of, lot of resistance, and there, to this day, there's some hiccups in the transition. But I'm just incredibly impressed at the, at the work that this whole team did, the leadership of Rich Brewer and Karen Larson. And so I want to thank all of you for your service, and um, it was an incredible accomplishment. And you'll hear more about the SWAMP program success. Ed Fearing, <laughs> Melissa Morris, Calvin Yang, Jennifer Salisbury, Lori Weber. So thank you all. <laughs> and Rich, do you have anything you want to add to this? Okay.
Yeah, you know, as an alumni of Swamp, I just want to let you, you all know I knew this was really difficult, and, and you really deserve this award. And Greg, you did a great job of describing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always a nice way to start the meeting. And uh, now we're on to the public forum, and this is the time when we hear from anyone who wishes to speak for a few minutes on an item that is not on the agenda today. We have one speaker, Ocean Meserve, from the local agencies of the North Delta. Welcome, Ms. Meserve. Nice to see you. Oh, it's not on. There must be a button. Good morning. Uh, as you mentioned, I represent local agencies of the North Delta, also friends of Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge and various water users within the Delta. And I came this morning to speak to you on a closed session item that's at the end of tomorrow's meeting regarding um, discussion of procedures to use in the water fix tunnels petition that um, the board is moving forward on considering. And I just wanted to uh, touch on two topics briefly this morning. Uh, first of all, um, the, the notice cites government code section 11126C3 as justification for closed session on this item. And so I looked into that to see why is the water board discussing procedures for a matter that no evidence has formally been presented yet. Um, and um, a case was cited to me by um, counsel for water board, which is called Cooper, um, which involves a disciplinary proceeding for a psychologist um, that was losing his license due to some very bad acts. Anyway, in that case, um, there had already been evidence submitted upon which that board could deliberate upon, and that's and it was evidentiary questions that the board was considering. And also, the subject matter of those deliberations was placed, um, was discussed in the public record and placed in the public record. Um, so I was advised that there was no duty to disclose to the public which items the board is deliberating on. However, I don't believe that this case stands for that proposition. And indeed, the general rule, as I'm sure that you are all familiar with, is that meetings should be held in open. And for instance, I was reading the guide to the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act says, an agency may not meet in closed session because it wants to have a frank and open discussion among only members on a matter of controversy. In order for a me an agency to meet in closed session, the closed session must be specifically authorized by statute. Therefore, I believe that it would not be appropriate to meet in closed session regarding the water fix petition. Um, and I would request that that be done in open session so the public could participate and understand what, what is going on. Secondly, I want to point out, and I know that you've received some correspondence on this, but that the, it's, it's entirely premature to consider the petition that's been submitted. Um, I just want to touch on two things. Um, because I'm looking at injury to legal users of water and also fish and wildlife as a practitioner in the field. Um, and this, this project diverts nearly half the flow of the Sacramento River just south of Sacramento here. So there's a question as to whether it even is a change in point of diversion and it's an entirely new water right. But setting that aside for now, the problem that we are having is that the project has not been described. As you know, there's just a draft EIR. Um, and the operational range being proposed has not been disclosed and is perhaps under development with respect to the biological opinions that are being worked on by the agencies for this proposal. However, this hinders an assessment of injury to legal users of water and fish and wildlife with the fact that the full operational range being proposed has not been disclosed to the public and we can't review. Additionally, modeling does not exist for the, the um, for the water fix um, 
proposal. And the modeling that does exist was for an entirely different um, proposal, which was the one that included the HCP and the NCCP. So for instance, there's a, you know 25,000 acres less tidal marsh, um, different operations of the head of old river barrier, um, different operations of the salinity control gates. Um, and I'd like to point out that, you know, despite that water board's comments on the water fix actually misstate and say that alternative 4A is modeled using the Edmonton's salinity compliance point. This is on page two of the board's October 30th comment letter. In fact, that was not modeled. The, the recirculated EIR goes into a sensitivity analysis to try to describe why it was not necessary to model that. And so I just want to point out that the water board doesn't have before it the information that it needs and its own comments are erroneous in assuming that there's been modeling that in fact has not been done. So this is very troubling obviously to people who are impacted by this and we would ask that, you know, that, um, there be a complete project description. Um, in addition, you've heard that the water quality control plan, of course, is a big concern. We know it's not protective of beneficial uses in the Delta right now. We know it needs to be updated. That absolutely needs to be done first. So in closing, I would just say I'd request that any discussion of the procedure for the tunnels petition be done in open session and that the, we postpone the consideration of the water fix petition at a minimum until the water quality control plan is complete until the EIR is complete, until there's been actual modeling on a full range of operations. Thank you. So or just- Will you talk about the leak? Yeah, go yeah a couple different things. We don't things. have staff to talk about the other things. First of all, with respect to uh, Ms. Meservey's comments about the timeliness of the petition, um, obviously, the public forum component here was not noticed. We'll make sure that that is included in the record so that all of the interested persons have, although she's repeated many of the arguments that have been made in uh, paper submissions that are already posted on the board's website for a complete record and so other parties have an opportunity to comment, we'll make sure that <clears throat> her appearance in public forum is duly noted. As for uh, the propriety of the closed session, this is something that we looked at closely within the legal office. She's right, in general, the board cannot meet in closed session. Um, however, um, she noted that the Bagley, the AG's office uh, Bagley Keen guide says that there is an exception for that if there is an appropriate statutory exception provided. We've looked at the case law and believe that under C3 of government code section 11,126, which expressly authorizes a body to meet, to deliberate on a decision to be reached uh, pursuant to the um, evidentiary hearing and uh, adjudicative proceeding provisions of the APA, uh, which the board will be doing with respect to Cal Water Fix. There will be many, many days of hearing, all of which will be open. There will be um, pre-hearing conferences that will be open, but there is an appropriate fora. We looked at the Cooper case um, and believe that the board can appropriately have a closed session prior to the commencement of the evidentiary proceeding. Um, you know, in this particular case, most of the work will be done by the two hearing officers um, who will be overseeing the day-to-day -day, um, handling of motions. Many of the issues that um, Ms. Meservey raised with respect to the propriety of the timeliness of the petition and the timing with respect to the water quality control plan versus the petition for change in point of diversion would be addressed through motion practice as part of the hearing process. So um, our view, and we feel pretty comfortable, we looked at it pretty hard because we recognize this is a little bit unusual, uh, but also this is going to be a fairly extensive proceeding and it's appropriate in our mind under Government Code Section 11-126-C3 and the Cooper case for the board to have closed session discussions on some of those procedural issues. Ultimately though, how the board handles those procedural issues will be the subject of open either motion practice on paper and through the pre-hearing conference and then ultimately um, open board deliberations and decisions. Not being familiar with the Cooper's <coughs> case, would you mind just briefly uh, explaining how that applies to this particular situation and how that um, um, is applicable to a closed session without the introduction of evidence? Because I think that was her point that no evidence has been introduced into the record yet. 
Yeah, in terms of looking at how the court construed uh, the propriety of a closed session, it, it did not turn on, it, it, it wasn't essential to the holding of the case that there had been some preliminary evidence introduced in that case. Um, the, the core issue that the court had to decide on was whether or not it was appropriate for the body exercising the closed, se closed session exception of the bagley Keene Open Meeting Act to deliberate on preliminary issues, if you will, in closed session as opposed to the final decision of the board. <coughs> So that's specific to preliminary issues surrounding, in this case, I assume the, 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 the procedures decision of the hearing. refers to procedures. Thank you. <coughs> All right, next uh, we'll consider the minutes from the November 17th board meeting. Is there a motion? It was an edit that I pointed out to staff, and if that edit is made, um, I will move for adoption. The edit pertains to item six and the action you took or didn't take on item six. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aries, uh, next uh, we have two items, two and three, that are uncontested. Do we have any cards for those? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, next is item number four. Good morning. My name is uh, Les Grober. I'm Assistant Deputy Director for Water Rights. And I have a brief update, mostly revolving around some of the uh, uh, public trust emergency regs for flow issues, but a couple of uh, comments also on the Delta. First, with regard to Mill Deer and Antelope Creek, we received a request on the 24th from the National Marine Fishery Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They submitted a letter requesting that the board readopt the emergency regulations for Mill, Deer, and Antelope Creek. So state board staff plans to bring that to the board at the January 19th uh, meeting for readoption of those emergency regs. With regard to the Russian River Tributaries Emergency Regulation, um, we sent out reminder notices regarding compliance of the inform informational order that was released for the uh, Russian River Emergency Reg to landowners and water suppliers. That was done in late October. That increased the uh, rate of response to providing that information from about 50% to over 75%. So we're now gonna be in a mode to send out uh, administrative civil liability complaints to those that have not responded to the order. Mr. Grover, I, you know, yes. I, I'm a liaison with North Coast Region, and I had some questions when I was at their regional board, you know, offline questions about, you know, the ACL strategy. And I, I realize we can't be real specific, but, you know, that is this uh, procedurally, is this done through the mail? Um, how are folks uh, notified and, and what, kind of order of magnitude are we talking about in terms of penalties or other information? I think that that is still, that's being evaluated this time. It would be through the mail, but uh, that's something that we'll be resolving in the coming weeks. So we can provide an additional report uh, at the next board meeting. Thank you. Uh, related to this activity, um, but not specifically related to drought is work that we're doing under the California Water Action Plan. Um, we're going to be holding two workshops um, in the coming weeks in Santa Rosa. They're going to be on December 17th and January 26th. That's part of the State Board's effort working with the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, to enhance stream flows statewide. 
Uh, part of the reason for mentioning this is that one of the five tributaries statewide is Mark West Creek, which is also the subject <laughs> of the Russian River regulations and the emergency drought regulations. Um, so we've invited other uh, agencies and other uh, non-governmental entities to uh, participate and partner in these <laughs> workshops, um, including um, Sonoma County Water Agency, the National Marine Fisheries Service, Trout Unlimited, and the County of Sonoma. And finally, and this will be a segue to talking briefly about uh, Delta, we've received now the application for the uh, West Falls River barrier for 2016. That was that uh, emergency barrier project that was put in to help control salinity in the Delta. We received that um, um, just uh, on November 10th. Um, and it's very similar to this last year, except it's talking about, since they're getting started sooner, an earlier installation, April 1st, and removal on November 30th. That compares with the, this last year, where it was May 1st and November 15th. And that's uh, perhaps a good segue to the, the last element I'll talk about which has to do with Bay Delta operations. As you know, we're gonna be getting a, a more full update from the uh, Water Resource Agencies, Department of the Bureau, and the Fish Agencies at the next board meeting. But uh, for now, what has just bubbled up is because of the lack of really good rainfall, effective precipitation, conditions have been relatively dry in the Delta, so there have been salinity control issues, in particular now with the removal of that barrier, it has allowed with the most recent high tides for salinity to come further in. So there's been concern and, and you know, just that kind of tight operation that is not dissimilar from uh, uh, the situation that occurred in January 2014 when they were really dicey in terms of control of salinity. Um, and that in part has led to the, uh, the exceedance for four days of the adjusted Rio Vista standard. They did not meet the uh, the seven-day average of 2,000 by just a bit. And that's because of that trade-off in, in terms of keeping the delta fresh and uh, alternatively putting the water out uh, past Rio Vista. So in response, the uh, releases from Oroville are going to be going up by about 200 CFS to help to provide that cushion for salinity control. So, yes, I see a question. Well, no, I'm just wondering if there's any update on the, when will we have more info on the salmon bait? Oh, uh, that's going to be... I know that'll be in two weeks, but will we know before two weeks? Will we see another press release? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so, but the, num the follow-up numbers have not been much better in terms of the uh, winter run salmon uh, uh, numbers. Um, we'll be getting the more, you know, the, the best information we have in the moment in terms of the, uh, the estuarian species and the salmon species. There have been other little issues of some dewatering of reds, of fall run salmon that have occurred, as you recall, because they reduced flows down to a fixed level. During that ramp down, there was some red dewatering. So that, that more full update will be provided in a couple of weeks. Um, but just as I think I said this at the last update, until we get some significant rainfall in particular, there's going to be this continued really tough trade-off of, uh, you know, how to, you know, get the best bang for the buck from the, the uh, limited available water without making additional releases from storage at this time. True that um, just the fact that the antecedent dry conditions make it so that it's not even the precipitation issue as much as the runoff issue with um, you know much of the precipitation being percolated in the soil at this point. Very much so. I mean, it's going to take a number of storms before you really have that effect of precipitation, which is why it, in some of the words I should mention the, the drought contingency plan that is being developed. And of course, that's a two part. The first part dealing with um, December and January, depending on if we have years that are similar to last year or the previous year, but that mostly revolves around uh, how they're going to be operating the Delta uh, cross channel gates, uh, trying to, you know, limit how much more it is opened, you know, 
balancing that again in terms of keeping it closed for fish out migration, in this case also Rio Vista outflow, as opposed to maintaining salinity control in the delta. But your point is well taken because of the extremely dry antecedent conditions, it's going to take a more significant storm to really push us up beyond where we have those concern levels. And also as part of that discussion of just the hydrology, even in the event of a normal year, um, it's, it is not going to be a normal rainfall runoff response, which has the concern. So there will be some words about that in the drought contingency plan as well. And what one does with that remains to be determined because water supply and ecosystem resources have been hit hard. So what to do in the event of a normal year. And there'll be words about this as well. Also, we're going to be preparing and releasing before the next board meeting the order on reconsideration for the TUCP for the uh, state and water project, uh, Central Valley project operations. Yes. Oh, sorry. When is our hearing on that now? It's, that would, I know it's later than I wanted it, but... I think we're still looking for doing the next meeting, but uh, yeah, the 15th. On the 15th? <coughs> yep. Are we going to be here for 24 hours on the 15th? And, no. and, and when would we receive a draft of that? When do you expect? In the next few days. I mean, you'll be seeing a draft, and we'll be releasing a public draft in time for the uh, release of the agenda. I have some questions about um, the emergency reg on, uh, on mill deer and antelope. So as far as the need to adopt in January, I'm going through the order, and I didn't expect that this was going to come up today. So I... I'm not remembering exactly the period of the flows, but is this to get out a base flow? Um, because the um, the pulse flows I, and any other flows, I don't think were required that early in the year. In the past, in past years, there have been just looking here. There have been uh, late January, early February flows. There have been water diversions on Mill Creek that has caused stream flows to drop quite significantly. Um, so this is to help have some base flows below which they would not drop in the event, again, that we don't have uh, effective precipitation. The, the base flow provisions of the emergency regulations are actually in effect right now. Um, and so we're looking in these three, in these three systems, three watersheds, we're essentially looking at um, having those base flows, at least during these drought periods, um, being set virtually for most of the year except for the drier summer months. So I, what troubles me on this, and it's interesting because we just had the discussion um, yesterday, or I did a briefing with staff on the conservation um, order and sort of this trickiness of moving forward, developing something, giving people plenty of notice uh, that uh, perhaps the emergency reg would be extended, but at the same time trying to take into account uh, the conditions. And so um, I think it's important on this to make it clear what our authority would be based on uh, an emergency and um, what about that gray area where maybe there's some additional precipitation and some of these conditions have been addressed but not fully that we are truly exercising our authority pursuant to emergency regulations, whether it's to require minimum flows or pulse flows. And so um, that early um, in the year, it, it makes sense um, if the conditions warrant on a base flow, but we're not going to know yet on the other provisions. That's why, and so the current regs expire um, December 29th. So a lot, I mean, both with regard to these tributaries, but all these tributaries, it, the, the next month is going to be terribly important to know how those antecedent conditions are affected. Are we going to be getting that effective precipitation? So this is just, it's, 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 it's certainly in the event of, if all of a sudden these El right. Nino flows here, then, you know, it, they, it, we might make the determination that these are not needed. But if conditions such as the current continue, then it, it seems that they will be needed. Yeah, I understand that. And I think on this, especially because of some of the work that um, I've been doing and stakeholders and staff, you know, really uh, working um, in that area 
to try and move toward additional voluntary agreements that it would be important to have um, a workshop or some stakeholder meetings on this. For purposes of the, the extension, extension, right? Um, could those, would the, are those workshops that you're looking for to be tied in with more the voluntary agreement aspect? So is it something that you would see us teaming up with CDFW on as the season progresses? Because they're in the process right now of trying to, you know, continue to negotiate those voluntary agreements well, as well. No, I think it should be on the emergency reg and for us to make it clear um, we may not be adopting it um, in its entirety. Uh, it, may, it may not be enti extended entirely, um, you know, mirrored what we adopted this year. And I, I think that if the stakeholders hear about this, it would be a little confusing in light of the fact that we're working toward voluntary agreements. Um, there's an expectation that there is going to be you know, changed in conditions this year. So just using it as an opportunity to talk with them about uh, some of the different options that we might be considering. And then in that context, uh, also, um, again, encourage the voluntary agreements. Just a way to uh, work with the stakeholders more directly on this. We'll uh, contact the Department of Fish and Wildlife and try to come up with a, an approach. Um, I don't believe that they're asking for any significant changes from the current, what is currently in effect right now in terms of the base flows and the pulse period. Um, but we can, so we'll work with them on um, an approach to meet with stakeholders in the region. I believe there are, they are meeting with stakeholders currently. I, I, I would have to check to see what that, that level, but, uh, but since we have, well, if you will, an it's been an emergency basis, but this would be a, a continuation of this. We have our other outreach tools or, you know, LyraServe and things like that. So it's not that it's a, a, it would be a new thing. So perhaps a mix of using the current communication tools that we have, um, we can explore doing this. You know, I'm not sure, you know, when, what, what would be the, the time for doing a workshop or we just reach out to some of the, the major entities that have been involved with this just to give them a heads up. Now, what, um, what's the number of players? I mean, this isn't the Russian River. That's correct. This is a much more limited number in each of these that are directly to affect. I don't know the, well, we're not talking thousands. We're talking dozens and, you know, per. I thought it was like a hundred. Ten. Yeah, I mean, at, well, at mo it, yeah, it's very few for the major ones that are affected. So we'll, we'll schedule you know, something. We'll talk with Fish and Wildlife and we'll schedule a meeting with the stakeholders. Yeah, it makes sense for them to know what it is and what it isn't so that we don't get an out, well, so that people don't react just because they're surprised and assume it's something new. One thing, you know, just in the spirit of open communication, have, have you all um, in your discussions, Board Member Diadamo, um, anticipated that the regulations were expiring in December and that and that this request to be extended may come up? I mean, has this... Is it really that big of a surprise? Well, we didn't talk specifically about an extension. Um, I, I recall that I specifically said that uh, you would expect that uh, we see continuing emergency regulations when there is an emergency, okay, ongoing drought. But uh, we didn't talk about sort of this gray area where you end up with some precipitation and maybe they would question uh, the need for an extension uh, mirrored exactly as uh, what we adopted this year. So we did not discuss that situation. And we didn't talk about you know, the, uh, the date that it would be expiring. So the focus was really um, an ongoing drought, fifth year, similar to what we saw this year. We didn't talk about uh, different conditions. And I thank you for participating in those discussions. It's been, I think, really very useful and productive. That's all I have. That was very helpful. Thanks, Les, for your ongoing leadership on all of this. <coughs> all right, next we have our eagerly awaited update on emergency water conservation regulations. Drum roll, please. 
<laughs> David Boland's not here. Maybe he's sick. Someone check. Oh, he's probably at their conference. No, it's two. Does it start today? Oh, yeah, probably some of it starts today. I'm sure he's listening, though. Hello, David, wherever you are. So that means we all have to say saveourwater.com as often as possible. Again, go back to the old. Uh, <coughs> Let Dave get to that point. Keep it in the namesake. Good morning, Chair Marcus, uh, members of the board, Catherine Landa with the Office of Research Planning and Performance, and to my left is Jasmine Oaxaca from the Office of Enforcement. Today, uh, we're going to be presenting our monthly update on the emergency water conservation regulation focusing on the October 2015 results. Um, the data we're presenting today are also being released today, and they should be um, available on the conservation reporting page of the Water Board's uh, conservation portal as we speak. So October is the 17th month that we've uh, been collecting conservation data from suppliers. And it is also the 15th month that we have a statewide goal to reduce total potable urban water use by 25%. Um, for October, the 409 of the 411 suppliers that are required to submit these monthly ports did submit by uh, November 18th, which is the day that we pulled the final data set. In addition to you know, receiving and analyzing the uh, monthly data submittals, our Office of Enforcement staff have also been busy assessing supplier compliance and taking any follow-up actions that may be needed based on the June to October cumulative uh, savings and, um, or, and working with those suppliers if they're not meeting their uh, conservation standards to uh, help ensure that they are uh, meeting compliance. We do typically see a correlation between the climate and our conservation savings. So every month we do look at, uh, you know, how the temperature and our uh, numbers are in a relationship. Uh, typically the cooler, wetter weather results in a greater savings. Um, and you can see on this map, on these maps, with the precipitation on the left and the temperature on the right, with the uh, 2013 baseline for the regulation in orange and our 2015 in blue. Statewide, October was a, a bit of an odd month. It was, uh, for 2015, it was above average in terms of temperature, and it was about seven degrees warmer than October 2013 but it was also wetter than October 2013. Um, it was still dry, but it was, it was wetter than what we saw two years ago. The majority of the rain that did fall occurred along the coastal regions. Um, you may remember that in October, LA uh, experienced enough rainfall that it did result in mudslides um, and the, the closure of I-5. Um, despite the fact that October was warmer, Californians did continue a high level of savings that we've seen since June uh, using 41.9 billion gallons uh, fewer this October than they did in October 2013. That uh, savings is seen on this graph as the difference between the top of the blue column and the top of the orange column. The savings is three times uh, greater than the 13 billion gallons of water that we saved uh, in October 2014 when we had the, the mandatory, or the, sorry, the voluntary call to save 20%. Um, and that's really exceptional considering that um, October is both the first month uh, since the current version of the emergency regulation went into effect, that our 2013 orange baseline is below 200 billion gallons for the month. Um, you know, as everyone is aware, the compliance with the regulation is a comparison of current, say, current water use to that baseline. So the lower the baseline, the more difficult it becomes to achieve that 25% target. 
Um, the 41.9 billion gallons that we were able to save in October does equate to a 22.2% savings for the month shown here on the uh, fifth purple column. While it's lower than our, you know, the 25% that we'd like to see compliance is done on a, the five month cumulative, which means that um, over the June and October time period, Californians have actually used uh, 297.8 billion gallons less water than they used during that same five month period in 2013. And that five month savings equates to a 27.1% uh, savings. So we, while you know, it was warmer weather in October, we saw a slight decline in our savings that was expected, but we are still on track and meeting and exceeding the, uh, the governor's savings call. That was my reaction too when I saw it. We, we've been trying to signal that keeping the 25% percentage was going to get a lot harder mm -hmm. as the as the cooler months came in because you were saving it off a smaller amount. Um, but but I felt when I saw 22.2, I was relieved because I thought that, especially since it was hot, that that indicated continuous conscious effort on the part of Californians that they hadn't eased up. It's just it was off a smaller baseline and then they're using so much water that so much less water than they were in September so folks are continuing to save it's just it's hard to explain it, it so it, you really you are pleasantly I don't know if surprised is the word but you used the word exceptional before that this this was is this sorry I'm not asking it right but is this higher than you thought it would be for October it's about where I was hoping it would be uh you know it was it was about far above average in terms of the the temperature it was still a drier year than we would like to see um, most of the state received very little rain as you you know saw in the the earlier graph so the fact that Californians are still you know continuing to hear the message and that's so much in part of what the the local suppliers outreach efforts are doing what save our water is doing you know what our the messaging is getting across. A number of suppliers have, you know, reduced outdoor irrigation to one day a week for these winter months because plants don't need as much water when it, even with minimal rain. Um, so it's it's fantastic. It is, as you said, it is going to get more difficult to continue a higher level of savings in uh, the, through the next few winter months because it is that lower baseline, and we we just don't have as much easy water that we can save. But it, it is hopeful that uh, people are still putting a concerted effort into the con their savings. Trying to, trans to signal that all along, but um, I just wanted to be sure if my reaction to it was correct, and we'll see whether that's too complex a message for folks to take uh, up. I think, I think people can understand it if they choose to, and that's why we picked the cumulative target and that's the one we have our eye on so okay good october was a strange month in that it had hot you saw on the graph much hotter temperatures than than in 2013 but the baseline of water use from 2013 was much lower so were it not for the almost summertime like heat in october potentially we would have been uh, at 25 or percent or above so uh, October being where it is in between the summer and, and the winter months, it, it may not be repeated with this type of, uh, these type of below 25% numbers, it's hard to say. It just had a confluence of some strange situations. Yeah, I think also it's worth recognizing going into winter that there's just less outdoor watering budget to cut. And so the overall percent will be affected by that. And so the expectations do need to be managed. But folks should turn the water off as much as they can. Yes. But water their trees. Water their trees. Um, so the statewide 25% savings goal that we do have equates to approximately 1.2 million acre feet of water to be saved by February of 2016. The um, 297.8 billion gallons equates to 913, 851 acre feet of water that we've saved to date. Um, this means over the five months, uh, we have saved approximately 76% of that savings goal. 
But as we move forward into you know the last half of the the regulation, we do want to continue to see that that savings so we can um, fill our bucket. Um, the based on an estimate that the an average person uses one fifth of an acre foot of water per year for their uh, residential water needs, uh, the water that we've saved to date. Uh, or for the last five months, is enough to provide 4.6 million Californians with water for one year. That is the uh, combined populations of San Diego County and Sacramento counties. Mm, I couldn't come up with a good volume. We've gotten too, too large uh, at the moment for what we could flood. We're closing in on a million acre feet here. Yeah. So um, in addition to reporting on their, uh, the supplier's total water production, suppliers also provide information on their residential water use. Uh, this is for the, their total residential water use, so that means both their, their indoor and their outdoor um, residential gallons per person per day, or the RGPCD, for October 2015 was 87 for the, uh, the statewide average. This uh, ranges significantly across the suppliers with our lowest supplier reporting an RGPCD of 34 and the highest uh, RGPCD reported was 312. Um, the RGPCD for September? It was 97 for the statewide average. People are consciously using less than they used last month. Too. I think that's significant. It is. Um, we see a reduction in the overall range. It, you know, the highest drops slightly uh, lower as well for from September to October. Uh, it's also significant, and I'll, you'll see this on the next uh, slide as well, that we've uh, significantly reduced our, our residential water use um, from last October as well. Um, there is a, a standard for uh, statewide uh, for the indoor residential water use of um, 55 gallons per person per day. For the month of October, 35 suppliers reported that their total residential water use uh, was less than this performance standard for indoor water use. And these uh, 35 suppliers represent approximately 2.6 million people. So as I said, the, um, the, our, the residential water use varies not only by the suppliers, but also uh, by your hydrologic region. This table shows the October RGPCD for the uh, regions and statewide for October 2013, 2014, and 2015. This is um, an example of what residential water use in pre-conservation efforts, the voluntary efforts, and the mandatory conservation efforts. Um, as always, I do need to caveat the October 2013 uh, numbers presented here are based off of um, October 2014 percent residential use and population. That's because suppliers are not required to um, provide those two uh, numbers when they submit their monthly reports. As you can see in the um, you know, the statewide numbers, we have significantly reduced our residential water use since 2013, where we were at um, 113 gallons per person per day. That dropped to um, 105 for October 2014, and we're now at that um, 87 gallons per person per day. And overall, the savings has been seen uh, fairly consistently throughout the state. Um, Nine of the 10 hydrologic regions have uh, improved or reduced their water use since last October, and all 10 uh, regions did see that uh, savings increase from 2013. You can um, highlight the, the, rain, the hydrologic region variability by taking this last column on the right and graphing it throughout the state. Um, 
As we mentioned earlier, the relationship between, uh, there is a relationship between your climate and your water use, and this is seen primarily in that, uh, the, the residential use, um, or the cooler coastal regions such as uh, the North Coast or the, the San Francisco Bay have uh, an overall lower residential water use, while the warmer uh, southern inland regions such as the Colorado River have a, a higher residential water use. Similarly, the percent savings shown in purple, um, also very significantly by hydrologic region. Uh, nine of the 10 regions have improved their savings between October 2014 and October 2015, including the South Coast region, which uh, continues to do an exemplary job of savings. They actually increased uh, their regional savings from 1.8% from October 2014 up to the 20.7% that we're seeing on this graph. And you know, since South Coast is home to approximately half of the state's population, that level of savings is um, impressive. On that same note, every month we do try to highlight some of the uh, successful conservation work that suppliers throughout the state are doing. This month, uh, we're taking a look at a handful of suppliers that are in our, our higher conservation standards. Uh, they had a, a traditionally a higher residential water use, putting them in a, requiring them to save 24% or more savings uh, for this current regulation. Um, and these 12 suppliers shown here have not only met that, but they've exceeded it. Um, every one of these suppliers has, is over their conservation standard by at least 10 percentage points. And these are all uh, smaller suppliers. So um, it's not only the work of the, the large suppliers, but you know we can show that everyone throughout the state is doing their part. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand it off to Jasmine. Good morning, Chair Marcus and members of the board. Um, I'm Jasmine Oaxaca from the Office of Enforcement, and I'll be talking briefly about our enforcement actions. Um, this slide shows supplier reported enforcement actions since June, um, or since April, sorry. And um, October shows a decline in the number of penalties and warnings issued and also complaints received, uh, which is not unexpected as we head into the cooler months and we'll likely see that same trend going forward. This slide shows um, the number of suppliers uh, and their, the compliance priorities. Um, as you know, one, two, three, and zero. And um, the number of suppliers in the various Compliance priorities is about the same in October versus September with a few switching around here and there. Um, although this overall shows improvement since, since June with a lot fewer um, in compliance priority one compared to June. These are our enforcement actions that we've taken so far. Um, we've issued 72 warning letters, 104 informational orders, seven alternative compliance orders, nine conservation orders, and four administrative civil liability complaints. And so far, um, Beverly Hills has, has paid their fine for that one. Um, based on the October numbers, uh, 24 suppliers had declined in priority, and of those, um, that triggers 15 additional enforcement actions. Uh, over the last month, I've taken a closer look at monthly reporting from the nine suppliers that, that have conservation orders. Um, note that the conservation orders were mostly issued to smaller disadvantaged communities and were mostly for compliance assistance. Um, looking at what at their numbers and their reports, um, for June through October, six out of nine suppliers have shown upward trends for 
their cumulative percent savings. However, only one supplier is actually meeting their conservation standard. Um, and eight out, eight out of nine suppliers are missing the, the cumulative percent savings in volumes by between five and 25% and between 30 and 370 million gallons. Supplier progress will continue to be tracked over the coming months, and in particular, I'll be looking more closely at their leak detection programs for the aging infrastructure and what is being looked at when they conduct water audits um, of commercial and industrial facilities and the residential, um, just to see if there's improvements that can be made. In addition to the ongoing enforcement actions um, for the next several months that may occur, um, there's a, not, a couple other items that we would like to just make you aware of as we're moving forward in through December. The, the first is the uh, current version of the emergency regulation, in addition to requiring large urban suppliers to submit uh, monthly reports was that the small urban water suppliers submit a, a one-time report. These are the suppliers that have somewhere between 15 and uh, fewer than 3,000 connections. To uh, assist suppliers with submitting this report, we do have an online small supplier reporting tool that is now live. Uh, it can be accessed via this link here. Um, and we've sent out, it, it went live today. And we've sent out an email to approximately 2,600 small suppliers uh, with guidance, you know, FAQs, and uh, inf more information on this report. Uh, next Monday, on December 7th, the water boards will be holding a public workshop to discuss the potential extension or modification of the emergency regulation. You know, staff will take that uh, all feedback we receive um, from that workshop and combine it with the information we've um, been hearing from our, our our meetings we've been holding over the last couple of months with a uh, select the suppliers, and that uh, the staff recommendation will be coming to the board sometime in the next couple months. Um, and the last date is uh, two weeks from today, and that is when the uh, report for those small uh, small suppliers is going to be due to the water boards. We will be uh, presenting that information to the board the uh, at the first January board meeting, and that all data we collect will also be made public when we do our normal monthly release. I have, and you may have uh, addressed this a bit, but um, for the small suppliers, the online tool, if it's live today, they have two weeks to fill it out. Are you going to be helping them? Because there are a zillion of these small districts, and then we may have some surprises of people who either didn't keep track or didn't meet their numbers or all that sort of thing. But I, I know part of it is they could also limit irrigation. It's not just meeting a number. So the small suppliers uh, can uh, be in compliance with the, the regulation in two ways. The first is to uh, show that they have reduced their total water production by 25% for June through November uh, 2015 as it compared to June through November of 2013. That's the primary reason why the report went live today because you can't report on November data un until the month is over. Um, the secondary way that suppliers can be in compliance is to reduce their outdoor irrigation to a maximum of uh, two days per week for that at during that entire time period. So to, you know, Meet by that standard, they would have had to have had two days outdoor irrigation requirements since the beginning of June. Um, we do have, as I said, we have put out a guidance on how to use the tool. We, when the emergency regulation first went into effect, we held a series of webinars to provide, you know, additional information of how this tool is coming up. Um, and the, the drinking, the small supplier reporting tool is actually being, um, is using the existing Division of Drinking Water's drink portal. So all of the suppliers that are going to be submitting this one-time report, 
should be familiar with that tool, and they can actually log in with their um, their uh, account that they use to submit their annual drinking water supply, and that will preload all of the 2013 numbers. So a supplier should actually, you know, should go in, they log in. Um, make sure their contact information is up to date, ensure the 2013 numbers are correct, and just provide the, the 2015 conservation and the number of um, days of outdoor irrigation allowed. Uh, we do have you know contact information that on our website that suppliers can always uh, contact staff as well if they need assistance. That sounds good. There you go. Good. One observation or, or um, question, I guess. Uh, I'm looking forward to the December 7 public workshop because I think we'll, you know, we'll learn a lot from what people are, are saying. In my uh, going around and talking with various people, particularly in Southern California and in the desert areas of Southern California, um, the many of these agencies have moved to targeting very high users. They're finding that, you know, sometimes it's 10 people or, you know, 100. It's really not very many who are causing them to miss their, miss the mark. And, um, and so they're, they're taking care of that. But um, uh, are we talking with them or getting information about their these these uh, kind of unique strategies to take them from where they are you know uh, kind of down uh, down to the the next level and that's one example of a strategy another is um, particularly out in the desert uh, I was uh, I was talking with uh, someone who's on the board of a desert water agency and um, she said that when the swamp coolers go on, which were subsidized by uh, energy agencies to keep people from using air conditioning, which, you know, you understand, uh, when the swamp coolers are on, as they were in, in June and August, water use is high because they don't have yards like, we, like you do on the coast. Um, but it, when it was dry in, Ju in July their numbers went down. So the swamp cooler in and of itself is a, is a challenge. And so I, it's there, and, and the leak detection is another, uh, another area where there's a, a, a possibility. So I'm thinking that we're gonna have to, uh, wor in working with other, with water agencies, kind of drill in to what will actually make a, make a difference, positive difference, for um, for these agencies, uh, it, it's not something that is blanket all, all over the state. Well, and to that, uh, the current version of the regulation does provide flexibility to suppliers. You know, we say you have a, a conservation standard that you're required to meet, but it's open ended in terms of how you approach achieving that because the supplier is going to be more familiar with the the you know the local climate on the ground, what's happening. So that is um, is currently uh, in place for those suppliers to uh, have that flexibility. Uh, that we have talked to a number of suppliers who you know have reached out and it would be primarily through um, the uh, request for alternative compliance orders to you know meet if there was that requirement. Um, and I, Jasmine, I don't know if you have a. We have, we have met with all of the suppliers that were in compliance priority one, and we've worked with them, you know, to learn more about their conservation programs that are in place uh, to see what they can do as far as their rate structures, um, you know, outreach and everything. But it is, it has been interesting to see how each supplier kind of has different concerns and uh, different things that they have to work with in their struggles and and we have tried to provide some compliance assistance. However, mostly we've only been working with, you know, the priority one missing their um, standard by over 15%. But 
but perhaps we can work with more. I'm not sure. My, my guess is that that uh, as we, we we're learning as as are the suppliers, and uh, that they will need us to help in some areas where they really can't do it. They can do a lot of things, but there are some areas where they really just can't, or at least the economy of scale is such that that we will need to to jump in. And so, um, you know, as you find these these areas, we should have a discussion about that um, in the you know in the new year. Thank you. Got to be something. Everyone should go to SaveOurWater.com and keep their trees alive. Thank you, thank you, especially the part on how to water trees, which is really important. Um, anything else? All right, thanks. I mean, pretty good news, considering it could have been a lot worse. Uh, the key thing, I think, is not just that it was hot, but also with all the stories about El Nino, I was worried that people, I think people get it, that it's going to take more than a little rain, and then El Nino is still... Uh, a prediction, particularly up north where we need it most and where we really need snow. Um, but I was, I won't say pleasantly surprised, I was relieved at the numbers. So good that we're still up there on the cumulative total. So thank you for all the great work and the buckets filling. That just makes me happy. So that was a great graphic. All right, thanks. We're going to now take about a 15 minute break before we launch into uh, a few meaty items um, just so that people can get caffeine, including me. And um, and then we'll be back. Fifteen minutes. That would be at twenty-two or so of.
my battery. Oh, my battery's not out. It's red, but battery's not out. All right. All right. Sorry for the delay. Apologize. It is um, 10.47 and we're reconvening. Thank you. Needed that break and needed this caffeine, so. Um, we're now on to item number six. And there you are. You're just ready to go. Oh, Mr. Rose, is there anything you would like to say again, even though it's on a different agenda item? Go to saveourwater.com anytime they want. So this will be, be really brief. Um, the governor's recent executive order, B3615, required the state board to prioritize temporary water rights permits to accelerate approval of uh, projects that enhance the ability of a local or, or state agency to capture high precipitation events, you know, the, the El Ninos that we're, we're expecting, and divert some of that water into groundwater storage. The, the fee proposal before you is we're proposing to do a very discreet uh, change to the water rights fees to add a fee for, for the applications of, of these temporary permits solely for the purpose of this, this temporary diversion of water in the storage. Um, in a nutshell, that's it. If, if you have any questions or want more detail, I'd be happy to answer. It is, like I said, very discreet. Um, the only thing I'd really want to add is we're trying to take advantage of, of the timing of this. I mean, the governor's order only came out on November 13th. We're here before you two weeks later. Because of that timing, we really haven't had a chance to do our normal deliberative process where we go out and discuss this with the stakeholders or anything. But, and that was a little bit by design. You know, we expect the rainstorms to come January, February, March. We really wanted this to be in place so that we could take advantage of that when it, when it came. So we're, we're, we're striking while the iron's hot. Uh, I, I assume that there are people who can actually process this work. When the when people pay the fee, they're going to want a service, and so uh, so. Uh, yeah, the the executive order didn't didn't allocate us any additional staff positions, but we anticipate that the workload will be incorporated into our existing workload. And that's one of the things we're going to have to look at in the upcoming months, is we really don't know how many of these applications are going to come in, the volume. Um, and the fee is fairly nominal. It's a $100 base fee plus a dollar for every 100 um, acre feet above 10,000. So we're, we're anticipating the, the average bill will be about $150 is all. So we, and that again was designed to encourage these type of projects. So we do have staff available, but that's one of the things, if we get a ton of them, we're gonna have to be looking at and um, potentially coming back to you in the fall again with another revised fee schedule if, if, if it end, you know, turns out to be a lot different than we think it would. But there's also a sequel waiver, so that should help with reduced staff time. Right. And a lot of the actual projects that w could take advantage of these, they're obviously going to have to have their infrastructure in place and built for the most part already so that when the rain comes, they're, they're ready to roll too. Well, aren't, aren't there, uh, this is also, I mean, not to give it short shrift, this is an important, an important action to help folks that are trying to figure out how to capture more of the storm flows and you still have to, someone still has to look and make sure that it meets those two tests, that it won't hurt another legal user of water and that it won't unduly affect fish and wildlife by whatever diversion structure, whatever it is they're trying to do, right? Which is important for somebody to look at, but probably not as hard as something else given that it's not in the low flow times of year. Exactly. It'll still go through the, the complete review that we, you know, program staff typically do. That's a really good point, and I, I know that staff is doing this anyway. But you know, lessons learned, looking back. But that would be um, a good point to include. Um, how did things go? How many people applied? How many, you know, how many entities applied? How many fell out? Um, and to the extent that we know, what were the reasons? 
because we are looking for, as you say, a way to, to protect. We still have to you know, go through that analysis, or staff has to go through that analysis. But at the same time, everything that we've been saying is you know, encouraging people to uh, capture this uh, type of water and, and you know, other just regular storm flows, not necessarily El Nino. So just very quickly, um, you know, obviously it's, uh, we are proposing this because of the emergency nature of the drought and the condition of the groundwater tables for this year. But I have asked staff to work with stakeholders over the next six, seven months to look at the, how we ought to be setting fees permanently for these kind of recharge projects, plus the long-term extraction from the recharge projects. My take on the existing regs is that it's really not very well designed for a project of this nature, and that it's critical that we you know, make sure we do something in the more long-term. So I have every expectation that we will be bringing this back to you in September with another amendment to reflect what we assume to be the ongoing work associated with this. But not just fees, how we might want to adjust our regulations in other ways in order to make sure that we're dealing with these issues and allowing for the appropriate capture of flows and getting it into groundwater without doing harm? It's not just about fees, or do you have all the authorities you need to do it? Well, clearly we have temperature, I mean, temporary permits and we also have, you know, the long-term permits. But, but you do raise a good point that, you know, it, because of the nature of the very large storage and existing groundwater tables and the fact that when somebody puts that water into the groundwater, it's difficult to necessarily track exactly what's happening associated with that. And perhaps there is some need to look more broadly at our existing regulations regarding permitting. And so... I'll uh, have a look at that as well. I think well, that's clearly needed in the context of the Sigma uh, development and the groundwater management plans that are under development. And right, and, and along those lines, just even uh, to have a uh, session where we talk through these issues because there's so much confusion out there. Like why you even need, why it actually makes sense to get a permit? Why you should want to get a permit? Why you, if you, if, if if you don't need a permit, that means other people don't need a permit, and right. maybe you can't get that water that you think you're entitled to, and then the whole issue of ground uh, water recharge, beneficial use, conjunctive use, um, uh, what's allowed for within the construct of existing permits as far as uh, a time of use. Yeah, people don't. I mean, people in the water rights world do, but most regular people don't understand that water rights permits are time, place, and method of diversion, not just amount. So Yeah, and, and this diversion of storage in a reservoir versus an underground reservoir and all of the, the significant technical differences that are involved and how to kind of true up those concepts. Because folks imagine the underground reservoir, you know. Like it's a tub. Like, like the tub, yeah. exactly. And, and how do we transform that to, to reality-based regulation? I'll just note that um, what we're here with right now is the fee structure to allow this to go forward um, beginning until um, un until it's brought back to you, as Tom said, perhaps for revisions based on things that we see coming in. Uh, the Division of Water Rights is separately working on what the process for these permits will be like, and that's not what's in front of you right now. Um, on I have a printout from the division's website uh, dated November 12th that talks about applications for groundwater recharge and storage. So they're already working on how this will work and all the things that you were talking about. No injury, but this is to capture high flows. So you've got some advantages in terms of what you're looking at. But this is the an initial fee structure so that people can do this soon. Great, great. Move adoption of the resolution. Um, of emergency regulations amending the water rights fee schedule uh, for this new fee for temporary permits for diversion of underground storage and high flow events. Is there a second? I will second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Carries. Thank you very much for the quick work and for the price break. I know you need to have a price on it for fairness, but thank you for making it easier. Item number seven. Thank you.
Hi. Morning, uh, Board Chair Felicia Marcus, uh, fellow board members, uh, David Ciccarelli, Division Administrative Services. Um, I'm here to present the next item, which is uh, uh, amending the fees for the uh, Environmental Laboratory Accredited Program, better known as the ELAP program. Um, and I'm here, um, accompanying me is uh, Christina Sotelo, uh, Program Manager for the ELAP program. Um, I want to start with just a, a little bit of uh, program information or, or background information. Um, the, um, the ELAP program was transferred to the Water Board on July 1, 2014, uh, with the rest of the uh, Safe Drinking Water program uh, from uh, the California Department of Public Health. Um, upon that transfer of the, uh, of the program, uh, staff uh, determined at the time that the program was um, not generating sufficient revenue to support the program. Um, and uh, basically, there was kind of two major reasons why the program wasn't generating sufficient revenue. Um, first, uh, there hadn't been a, a fee increase in over 10 years. Um, and um, as I mentioned in a lot of our other programs that, um, that um, employee cost and state operation costs continue to grow up each, uh, go up each year, um, usually on an average of about 3%. So over these 10 years, again, there wasn't a fee increase, but um, costs for the program continue to grow. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, of course, those are employee compensation, retirement, health care, Prorata costs, kind of your, your standard cost to uh, operate the program. Um, secondly, one of the other factors um, was that historically, um, and, and, and the program is, is, there's a fund known as the Environmental Laboratory Improvement Fund, which helps support this program where the funds go into. Um, there were two fund uh, resources that were going to, of course, fees from the ELAP program, and then, of course, fees from the national ELAP program. Um, and on January 2014, California withdrew from the National ELAP program. As a result, um, there was approximately about 75 of these labs that part uh, previously participated in the National ELAP uh, program, and they applied and they were accepted in ELAP. Um, however, the, the fee structure on ELAP, on average, generates much lower fees per a lab than the National ELAP program, which resulted oh, okay. in, again, a reduction of, of revenue. So, so the costs and the fees were much higher on the National ELAP program. So when that went away, they went into the ELAP, and again, uh, which uh, saw lower fees and, again, a, a reduction of revenue. Um, so um, looking at the program, staff has determined at this time that the program has a revenue shortfall of approximately 58%. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, our authority and um, um, currently right now on, on adjusting fees. Um, health and safety codes, currently health and safety code section 10425 allows fees to be adjusted annually by a percentage change determined by the Department of Finance in the Budget Act. And this is based off of, of the fund condition that we prepare. And so um, staff prepared a fund condition and it, it um, compared our program expenditures with projected revenue, and we determined that the program's short by approximately 58%. Um, and uh, when we were working with the Department of Finance, they were asking us, well, um, how are you going to go about and make this adjustment? Well, um, through our research, there was budget language over at CDPH that basically gave them the mechanism to go ahead and make this adjustment. Uh, well, through our, our research and working with finance and with our legal counsel, we determined that that budget language wasn't transferred over during the process. It was dropped out. Um, and so the um, Department of Finance worked with us, and uh, they put it into a trailer bill, which became SB 101. And basically what that did was it directed the Water Board to adjust the Environmental Laboratory Improvement Fund fees of the board as subject to annual fees adjustment pursuant to the Health and Safety Code 10425 and provides the fees may be increased by 57.84, so approximately um, 58%. Um, there, you know, I just kind of briefly talk about that uh, process. Um, uh, again, once we started working with finance, it, it became a, a confidential process. We really couldn't get out to the stakeholders and talk about it, but then once the bill became public, um, we took immediate steps went out to the stakeholders, and again, and I'll talk about that process in a, in a little bit, but we really got out to them and explained to them, you know, of course, the need for the fee increase and, and our uh, uh, authority to do it. Um, so, and then one other thing that the, the budget language also says is, is, as long as the fund condition statement for the, uh, for the fund projects a reserve less than 10% of the estimated expenditures and the revenues projected for fiscal year 2015-16 are less than the appropriation contained in this act, which, again, they are, basically. So 
Um, so again, that gave us, the, uh, gave us the authority to go ahead and make the adjustment. So based on the projected shortfall, staff is proposing an even split across the board uh, fee increase of 57.84% on the existing ELAP fee structure to make, to make the program whole. And just to kind of talk to you uh, currently, the current ELAP fee structure assesses a base fee and, a, and each uh, field of testing fee. Um, so the, the, the base fee currently is $959, and we're proposing to raise that by approximately uh, 58%, which would raise it to $1,512. And each field of testing uh, from uh, $432 to $681. Um, now, during this process, staff considered several different uh, options regarding increasing the ELAP fees that were kind of under our authority. And again, our, our current authority was that we could, we could adjust the base and we could adjust the field of testing by percentage, but for us to, uh, to revamp the whole fee schedule, we were looking at a lengthy rulemaking process, and we needed to get the program whole at this point. Um, so, uh, uh, so we considered, again, kind of different options of looking at perhaps maybe lowering the base or increasing the base and lowering the field of testing. Um, how a decision was made to increase both the base fee and the field of testing by an equivalent percentage. Um, Water board staff determined that this was the most equitable option for both fee payers as a whole, as well as being in line with the level of staff time required for certifying each lab uh, and field of testing. Uh, we looked at you know, increasing the base fee and lowering the field of testing fee would not only reduce the impact of fee increases to larger labs while magnifying the impact to small labs with fewer FOTs, um, but is also inconsistent with the additional amount of ELAP staff time required to certifying additional field of testings. And, and it, it goes both ways also. When you looked at increasing or lowering the, um, uh, the base and increasing the um, uh, each field of testing, we, we just, it, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't equivalent to, um, to their approach. Now, um, um, over the last several months, we've been, you know, hosting ELAP stakeholder meetings to discuss the need to adjust fees to generate sufficient revenue to meet budgetary expenditures. Um, we talked about the board process. Um, you know, we heard many different approaches and methods of adjusting fees. And again, you know, our current authority uh, authorizes us to, again, just increase the base and each field of testing to generate the, the revenue. Uh, and, uh, uh, excuse me, authorizes us to increase the base and the field of testing by a percentage determined by DOF. Um, and again, you know, in order to change that, we were looking at a lengthy rulemaking process. Um, and, and, you know, we, We've heard, we heard some great ideas. We, we understand that there is a need to, to change that structure and that uh, state water board staff is committed in partnering with the um, ELAP stakeholders to develop um, a completely new fee structure within the next year, uh, which will be more equitable and sustainable for the fee payers and the program. It's just at this point where, you know, we're about a million dollars uh, in the hole and that we need to, at this time, get whole and uh, to, again, to sufficiently run the program. Um, and so, um, again, we, we got out early on, and again, we've been meeting with the stakeholders, um, and we're willing to partner up, uh, set up meetings. Um, I, I kind of, we went through, kind of explained them kind of our robust pr process that we have for our other programs like water quality and water rights, where, um, you know, when the budget comes out, when our proposed budget comes out in January, that we're going to sit down with them, uh, look at that budget, and then, uh, explain kind of what our projected revenues are, and then really sit down and look at the fee schedule and look at our authority and how we can, how we can make, make the adjustments in the next year. Um, and kind of with that said, I know Christine and staff met with you guys, uh, or brought to you guys an item um, a few weeks ago on the um, ELAPS expert review panel, and it identified several issues. And again, these are kind of the same issues that I just kind of want to address right now, and, and, and Christine can kind of elaborate on these um, after this. Well, one, they identified that it, the program is operating at a loss. Um, that the panel does recommend that there needs to be a new fee schedule that's more equitable than the current fee schedule. Um, the, the panel recognizes that a change to fee schedule will be controversial because the laboratories that ELAP accredits vary widely uh, in the number of accredited FOTs, um, in addition to being of varying sizes and different uh, financial resources. Um, they also realize, and they mention this, that to mitigate these concerns, the panel recommends that the e ELAP program should seek stakeholder input on options for new fee structures as part of the process of rewriting the regulations, which again, we're committed to do. Um, and 
Finally, you know, while fees are likely to rise, the panel believes laboratories will realize increased value from the fees as the accreditation process improves. Um, so that's my presentation. Um, if uh, Christine has, I just want to add a couple words here. Is that um, from the program's perspective, you know, we we want to build a strong foundation for ELAP, and we're in the state of of change and improvement and. We need the, re the revenue and the resources to do that. Coming into the program, there were a lot of essential program functions that were not wholly implemented. Certifying laboratories, inspecting them, monitoring their proficiency testing. Those are the blind samples that laboratories send out to ensure that they're actually able to analyze those methods that they're certified for, and then enforcement. So they were, the program was was not implementing them completely and wholly. And so moving into the program, I, we could see that we needed to fill the staff to do all of the work. There were three vacancies and implement really all of the expert panel recommendations, not only fixing the fees, rewriting the regulations, but <coughs> adopting a standard for the laboratories, rewriting our regulations as a whole, um, having a management system for us to be held accountable that's very similar to the laboratory accreditation standards, um, and then c improving our communication. So all of those things weren't being done before, and so just as a whole, the program needs to have the, the staffing and the resources to do that. R remind me again, uh, when will this new and improved <laughs> um, fee structure be brought back to us? It'll be in the fall or when? when will uh, yes, we, it would be in the fall, so September 2016. And so we're, we're committed, the program, to, to starting um, to work with the stakeholders as soon as January. We'll, we'll talk, we'll discuss the, the new, the like more sustainable fee structure that's more equitable to all of the laboratories. You know, the, we have So meaning you'd have more different it categories because be in looking yes. at the letters and they're disgusting apples and oranges right. in some cases correct and 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 it, part of it we've already kind of started the process because again we've had three or four meetings with them and um a lot of the stakeholders understand that the program needs to get whole and kind of in our in the, in the timing that we're in right now but at the same time there was there was discussion on on how we could you know structure a new fee schedule again with like different tiers um, you know, I, from what we hear again, you know, it, a lot of it comes down to the level, level of effort of work on, on a lot of these field testing. Some take more time, some take less time. Currently right now they are, they all are paying the same amount. Um, and so we'll definitely look at that structure, um, and, and, and kind of, and, and program has, you know, they, they have the, the history behind them of knowing, you know, kind of how many hours it takes on, on average on some of these field of testings. So you're right. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely look at several different options. Um, and then, um, like any of our processes, you know, we'll work with the stakeholders and then, um, in September we'll, we'll bring to the board, you know, several different options and we'll have a, a recommendation for you guys. But we're not, this is not a fee for service. This is a, a fee. Oh, correct. It, you're right. It's not a fee for service. It's a fee for pay for the entire program. Um, well, why don't we go to the speakers? We have a number of them. Um, first, we have uh, Pamela Schemmer from Test America Laboratories, followed by Brad Meadows from BSK Associates. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the ELAP fee structure. Uh, Test America is a large commercial environmental testing laboratory with four environmental laboratories with California ELAP certification within the state of California and 12 other laboratories with California ELAP certification in other states. We do understand the need for ELAP to raise their fees at this time. However, we respectfully request that the fee structure be implemented in a manner that most represents the program needs and is fair to all the users. We, rec we recommend a significant increase to the base fee and only minor increases to the FOT fees at this time as opposed to the flat increase to propose to both the base fee and the FOT fees that is currently proposed. 
Currently, ELAP is granting certification to laboratories based on third-party accreditation when this is available. And as was noted, a lot of the laboratories um, had to seek NELAP accreditation out of state when that was uh, uh, left from um, California. Um, this third-party accreditation was recommended by the, e by the expert panel, and it eases California's review and auditing um, burden, especially to out-of-state laboratories. Um, and hopefully this practice will continue. Um, laboratories bear the cost of this um, third-party accreditation. However, when laboratories re, um, inquired to ELAP whether or not there would be a reduction in ELAP fees um, for using third-party accreditation for which they pay for, um, ELAP responded that there would not, and that's because um, it, it is not a fee for service, um, as you had noted. Um, it's, um, there are significant administration fees that ELAP needs to, to bear the cost for. Um, it's not just the cost of the audit. Um, and as such, that to us, that makes us feel that that's the base fee that all laboratories should be um, paying for, not just um, the laboratories that are bearing the cost of the FOTs, which tends to be the commercial laboratories in particular. Um, uh, so to make it more applicable to all the laboratories, it should be a significant increase to the base fee. Um, any future increases to the FOTs uh, should be taking into account the number of methods per FOTs, as some of the FOTs may have one FOT or one method per FOT, and some of them may have um, many methods that are a significant increase. So, to increase the FOTs um, evenly is really not. Um, a fair increase to the FOTs and really would would, um, would require more um, thought to increase the fees to the FOTs at this point. Um, also, I'd uh, like some consideration as far as the timing of the fee structure. Um, currently, there may be a fee increase um, as early as January for this 57% increase, 58% increase. Um, and because laboratories are in, invoiced as much as six months in advance, only the laboratories that are that have the certification coming due as, as early as June would get that increase. And then if we have another increase in September, not all of the laboratories are evenly bearing the cost of this increase. So uh, in order to get this increase being fair across all of the laboratories, I think there needs to be some consideration as to the timing as to how that's done. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, that helps me understand the point a little bit more. So as I'm understanding it, you just stuck with the 57 point, whatever that point is, the more or less 58% in both because of the enabling legislation because it was faster. Is it that changing, taking it, any of these changes, I mean, there were three I jotted down, uh, the base being higher was not something you felt that you could just do or it was something that you worried that it would disadvantage the really little. I don't know what the spread is between big agent, big labs and small. Well, we did definitely, um, in order us to really generate the revenue on the base fee, we'd, we'd have to bump it up. Um, and um, uh, a lot of the smaller labs only have one or two fill of testings. So um, there would be a larger burden on the smaller guys by increasing the base fee. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's a, Again, there's a, a, I guess, a lot, a, a larger number of the small guys that are on one or two of the. Of the 700 labs that we have, we have a, a, about 80% are considered small. There's a lot of definitions for small labs. It could be eight or less, but even an eight person lab is a large lab. So let's not get confused about the term small. Um, but 80% of the 700 labs are. They're not the large labs that have the 25, you know, plus employees that that analyze 100 or more samples a day. Um, but whatever percentage we choose it to to bump the the percentage up in base or in the FOTs, 
the differing levels or a variety of laboratories and sizes, they're all going to be equally impacted. So it just keeps the le playing field level until we can work on a more sustainable approach. Right. That is what I heard you say earlier, that there's a, a need to change it would require more process than we have time for, and there's a chicken and egg in terms of getting the funding in the door to be able to do the improvements that you see you need to do. How about the timing question that Ms. Schemmer raised? Uh, will everybody have to pay this, or only some, or how, how does that work? So the, the bill was, was signed by the governor in September, so that's when we started rolling with the increasing process. Um, but unfortunately... Yeah, the way the billing process works, we have our next billing would go out in January. And so we knew that um, as soon as September rolled around and we knew that we had, you know, had an adjustment of about 58%, and, and we knew this issue of the stakeholders you know, developing our budgets and... and uh, uh, you know, generating that revenue for this additional cost, um, we got out to them, you know, three or four months in advance, um, and, and we, you know, told them that, you know, the next billing cycle would go out in January. Um, and, you know, so we, we, were, we were honoring the bills that were sent out just prior to the, the bill being signed, and we immediately went out on our um, workshops and talking to the stakeholders about the increase and how we might do it, um, but it's Unfortunately, the the timing is not working out, and it's true that some will be issued the new bill, and others we want to honor it since we actually sent that out, sent them out. How does the billing work? I didn't quite understand that. When do people get bills? So they get they get a bill um, annually. They get a bill for the end. They get billed annually and every year, and we send it out three months in advance. They don't all get it at the same time, is no, right? No, no. On an it, anniversary date? It's the of anniversary some? date of their application. Right. So conceivably, you could have three months of people who might have a, might have a different number in the next three months. So when we get to that point in September, we can consider any inequities then? Or is it just three months out of the 12 months, we'll just have a different number? So, well, go first of all, with the bills, it, in the regulations, it requires you to submit an application in advance of the expiration. The bills are a, a courtesy, so you should be submitting your, your, your fees and your application prior to it expiring. So I don't think that the, the bill, the date on the bill that it was sent or when it was sent should be what we should be um, adhering to. Mm -hmm. I have it on, here we go. If I get it close, it pops. I'm sorry. I can't even do it when it's attached to my head. Um, I'm going to need one of those implants somewhere. Yeah, I've got to find a sci-fi movie that, um, so, so the folks that are, have an anniversary after September, whenever we do it, although we may not be done September 1st. So I'm trying to figure out the inequity is just there may be some people towards the end of the year, if that's when their anniversary hits, that might have a different number. Can't say if it's higher or lower. All right. Correct. I get it. But there would be an opportunity, as, as Felicia mentioned earlier, uh, to address any inequities between those that have an anniversary in January or June versus those that have a September or uh, later. Um, I mean, it, particularly if they're going to, if, if the number is going to be lower. I mean, it seems like everybody should should bear this year's problem, and then we'll deal with next year's next right. year in a much more uh, nuanced way. And I mean, I mean, and this is this is one of the issues that we're looking at during based off the current billing structure of, of these every three months. We'll also be looking at um, perhaps maybe only billing them once every six months, or putting in language where um, that the that the, the the regs may be retroactive back to July one. Um, that way, everyone would pay you know the same amount for that fiscal year. Um, so we're, we're definitely, th these are again, it, all the things it, th that takes these, time to figure out. Exactly. That we don't have. And, and okay. so we will sit down and we'll look at this. So, so just put that on the punch list for issues to, right. I'm sure people won't let you forget it. So 
I'm sure they want, but also, is there an incentive that you that you can wrap into? I don't know if the fee is the right place for it or if it's in the program for consolidation, because clearly you don't necessarily have to have as many labs as as we do. Um, definitely, I mean, we're uh, through the process, and, and like any of our other programs, I like to hear about you know building incentives into the fee programs. Um, of course, one thing that I always tell them is it is a zero sum game. So, you know, those that do qualify for the incentives, there's everyone else is going to pick up that burden. Right. But um, I'm I'm definitely open to it, and um, you know, if a program feels it meets their needs, definitely we'll look into it. Great, thanks. Um, next speaker is Brad Meadows, followed by Bruce Godfrey. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Brad Meadows. I'm the vice president of lab services with BSK Associates. We're a commercial laboratory network with a couple of locations here in the state, all of which are uh, accredited under the ELAP program. I am here to speak in opposition to this resolution. Um, I base this in that I believe that the fee increase is too high. I think that the allocations are inappropriately applied between the base and the, and the FOTs, as you've been hearing. And then I think it's actually a, a premature increase, if you will, uh, ahead of program improvements that are supposed to be forthcoming based on the expert panel review, which I believe that you're all familiar with. So the increase is applied to address a, a fairly significant budgetary shortfall, and I, I understand that. But that budget was also developed around a program that was meant to support two levels of accreditation, one the ELAP and then one the NELAP, the national, the national program. ELAP exited NELAP in January 2014. You've heard that as well. But there was also uh, responsibilities that ELAP no longer had to bear by exiting that program. And that's a very rigorous program and very extensive quality systems program. And so what hasn't happened, though, is, is there's been no adjustment in the resources uh, on the part of ELAP to account for those reduced responsibilities. And so I think that ELAP, in and of himself, should more uh, carefully examine, if you will, and consider restructuring their costs before levying a 57% increase on the customers that it is, in fact, serving. Second, the, as you heard, the out, there is an allocation between the base fee and the FOTs. However, the 57% even split between them does not actually really reflect the cost structure that ELAP is currently experiencing, which I think is indicative of where the program costs are. Right now, uh, the majority of the cost is more on the administrative side, more on the licensing side, and it is less on the auditing side. And I'm basing this based on uh, information that was in the expert panel review, which indicated that of a staff of 25 individuals, only seven were dedicated to the auditing function. The other 18 were either administrative or technical in nature, but certainly con considered non-auditing personnel. So, uh, obviously, the, the, the bulk of the cost structure and the bulk of the resource requirements isn't on the auditing, it's on the program administration, and it's on the licensing of the laboratories, if you will. And then finally, ELAP has yet to at least publicly announce what it intends to do comprehensively with the program and how it will implement the recommendations, if any, of the expert panel review. So any, uh, even as of, of 10 days ago, ELAP still hadn't at least uh, brought to the, to the community the nature of the quality system that we were going to be audited against, how they were going to audit their program, how they were going to manage their program, hold themselves accountable, as we've talked about. And so with that in mind, it seems premature to me, if you will, to address a budgetary shortfall for which they don't necessarily even know what the final end product is going to be. Are they going to implement all the recommendations of the expert panel? Are they going to go back and just maintain ELAP as it existed prior to the NELAP days? I think it, that's fair. If you were at our hearing, they are not planning to continue it. We got them, there's a chicken and egg issue here. I understand. So, um, right. And it, you have not received an increase in fee costs? For 10 years? 
Well, it's actually, that's kind of interesting because the numbers that we're seeing the basis for the 57% increase aren't actually the same ones we've been receiving for about the last 10 years on our, on our ELAP accreditation. Uh, our base fee has been $1,003 and our um, FOT fee has been 457, I believe. But the numbers didn't line up with what we saw as the basis for the 57% increase. But, but no, to beyond that, no, there's been no increase in fees since. So, thank you. Thank you. Do, do you want to comment on the workload difference from the NELAP issue? I mean, I know you have plenty of work to do, but just that there's a math question there that I want to get sure. So, So what they're referring to is the national accreditation program that we withdrew from in 2014. And they, there, we had a dual program in our regulations. So laboratories could either sign up for California's program and follow our regulations with or the requirements or the standards that TNI, um, the national program, AKA TNI, the national program requires. So they had a choice and they paid a higher fee if they chose the national program. What the staff in ELAP were trained to audit to the national standards, so they'd go into a lab, they'd do the same thing, but they would use a different checklist. The, the other difference um, in responsibilities from the national program is they submit two PTs a year as opposed to one PT, which is the proficiency testing samples, the blind samples, but, but really the workload is the same. And I do have to note that when you say that the responsibilities have lessened when we left the national program is actually not true because as I mentioned before, coming into the program, bringing the program over from public health to the water board, there were functions that weren't even implemented wholly. So we have a lot of work and a lot more responsibilities than when the program did come over, even though we lost the national program. And, and something I, I've been uh, bringing up to the stakeholders also is that, um, again, the program the, has, uh, uh, there have been vacancies, so it hasn't been fully staffed. Uh, there have been uh, different activities that weren't being met. Um, and as it's come over to the water board, again, one of the activities, and, and I know Christine talked about this during the, a few weeks ago, but like enforcement, there has been more enforcement taking place, and just basically putting everyone come on a level a playing field. And I've been telling the stakeholders, I said, you know, we need to basically run this program full with a full staff, um, fully funded, and evaluate it over a year or two to determine if, if it does need to be, you know, uh, if there are need to be program cuts, or if there needs to be augmentations to the program. But it really needs to be ran at kind of, you know, a, a full, full staff uh, and fully funded until we could really make that evaluation. I could add with respect to the expert panel report in the last meeting that you you that you met with us, uh, we're working on a work plan and we're going to have that out very soon, so everyone will be able to see, and that will be a public document. And, and the other thing, like our other um, perform, like other programs have performance plans and have our targets and our measures. This program will be the same. We'll have. Um, you know, we'll have targets that we'll set and, you know, we'll have measures and um, our accomplishments at the end of the year. So they'll be able to see where our resources go on that. Well, let's turn to our next speaker, um, Mr. Godfrey. Good morning. Um, I'm Bruce Godfrey. I'm the lab director of Curtis and Tompkins, an interesting company, c and We are pioneer San Francisco business, the oldest contract laboratory in the country, founded in 1878. We did wine testing in those days. Really? Yeah. I bet um, you have a story. We got photographs after the earthquake and fire. We lost everything prior to that. But yeah, we could tell you some stories. Um, I'm here in two capacities, one to uh, represent my current employers. I sold the lab to um, the Montrose Environmental Group in June of this year. Montrose operates two laboratories in California, 140 employees. We're one of the larger commercial laboratory entities. Uh, process about 10,000 samples a month for an average of six determinations each. Uh, in the second capacity, I'm the ACIL representative to the LTAC, uh, or Environmental Laboratory Technical Advisory Committee, uh, and the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. So I've been involved in the process through the transfer from Department of Health uh, and so on. So I'll share the views of the, of the community of commercial labs 
nationwide, essentially, about this program. Uh, our first issues are basically to reiterate what the first two commenters have said. Let's pay for the program. Uh, larger commercial laboratories tend to have lots of fields of testing. Uh, smaller labs, of which majority of the program are smaller labs. Uh, ELAP, I think, has about 400 labs that they accredit. The rest of the 700 are some version of accredited by somebody else and licensed by ELAP, but they don't visit the labs. Um, so I would say, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but we could get them. Half of the labs are not assessed, the other half are. Uh, the commercial laboratories want to keep the base fees high, pay for the program, and then set up a licensing fee because in our view, ELAP will take some time to undergo the transition that's necessary. We have no quarrel with the needs for the fees to run the program because uh, it wasn't pointed out quite as graphically as I'm gonna do it right now, but when they were part of ELAP, they were just as bad. <laughs> they, they weren't implementing the program, so. What Christine was saying earlier, they do have a lot of catch up to do. So in this sense, we don't have a concern about that, but we do have a concern about the standards they'll be adopting and whether or not we can use the service. Because right now we can't. Uh, all of the commercial labs who I represent from ACIL standpoint, we're just unable to use ELAP services. They're not recognized by anybody. So the state is operating a program which is uh, substandard. And now, we're trying to bring it up to standards. I got no quarrel. I'm part of the process. So, you know, I don't want to curse that. I want to keep it moving. So uh, we want to make sure we say that. Um, uh, so other than the fact we can't use the services, uh, we do have a concern during the stakeholder advisory process. We accepted the fact fees have to be raised. We raised some issues about efficiency and how do you dissolve the work groups or how do you organize them. Uh, as a commercial laboratory, we can't have a ratio of three supervisors for every worker. It doesn't work very well that way and that's kind of where they are now. So we're waiting for those changes to come where we have workers and chiefs and Indians and the proper ratios and I know another way to describe it, but we're interested in looking at efficiencies of operations and making sure that we make the program more efficient, more effective. Uh, to that end, the ACIL model is, it's probably best if California is not in the business of assessing laboratories. You let that assessment happen by professionals who do this for a living and let California license laboratories. A program like Florida has implemented, uh, Steve Arms, who was uh, on the expert review panel, he implemented Florida's program and they have seven employees overseeing 400 labs. So that type of program is what the trade association for commercial laboratories would advocate, you know, as a consideration through this process. Do we want an ELAP of 25 employees or do we want an ELAP of, say, a half a dozen running a program where professional assessors come in and do this? It's done in the clinical lab business. It's done with university accreditations and stuff like that. And that's... Uh, I guess that's about all I got to say about that, <laughs> unless you have any questions. I have a question for staff. R remind me, I know we spent an awful lot of time with the, what did the expert, the assessment group, the reviewers suggest about the last suggestion? The question of licensing of only versus oh. assessing. I can't, I just can't remember what they recommended. Well, the, one of the charge questions for the expert panel was to ask if we should, what Bruce said was, should we be in the business of accrediting labs? And the law, the Environmental Lab Accreditation Act, uh, uh, requires us to do so. Um, we, have, we have the staff that we have, and to use them to do, use a third party to do the work that civil service employees can do, it, they didn't specifically say that in the expert panel report, but we have the resources, we have the staff, we just need to train them and implement the recommendations that they, that they have in the report. Enhance communications, train our staff technically to do the audits, um, provide excellent customer service, you know, have standards that we are accountable to. We, we just have to do a myriad of things to get the program up to speed and working efficiently and, and wholly 
Um, but to answer his question, the, the report didn't specifically say get out of the business of accrediting labs. Are there other questions at the moment? All right, thank you. That was all very illuminating and helpful, and thank you very much for answering my questions, which I had beforehand. That's what I was trying to understand based on reading all those comments. Um, all right, do we have a motion, comments, discussion? I move that we adopt the resolution uh, for amendments to the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program fee schedules. I second the motion. All, right, all in favor? Aye. Carries. Thank you very much. We're obviously going to be spending a lot of time on this issue in the course of the next few months. So thank you. Thank you. Item number eight. Oh, I don't know. We may not have anyone here on this item, but why don't you summarize what it is for folks who may be listening over the web? But Yes, I believe we... But there may be people listening, right? so I think it's significant enough that you need to present it. Excuse me. I'm John O'Hagan with the Division of Water Rights. Uh, Mary Awi is next to me, to my left, and then to her left is David Rose. Item eight. I oh. start. Sir, I think everybody should adopt this item. I mean, everybody should go um, <laughs> go to SaveOurWater.com and water their trees thoughtfully. I see you morphing into David Bolin. <laughs> The only reason I'm doing this, I think, is because the first meeting I was on this item, no, nobody else said that, and I, I said it, and now it's a prize it's for my this. Thing. Maybe one of those sustained superior performance awards at the end of the year. I've kept this up. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Hang. That's quite all right. Item eight is a proposed resolution that amends and readopts a drought emergency regulation for informational orders. As you recall, in 2014, the board adopted an informational order item uh, for drought-related activities. The informational order provided the uh, board with the ability to request information from water right holders uh, in response to uh, complaints and or information needed to secure information pertaining to diversions of water and the basis of a right. That information has been used in our analysis for water availability, and in 2015 helped us determine uh, that water was uh, not used as, as great as in 2014, so we were uh, had the ability to lift curtailments earlier than we would have. Uh, and I believe we have no cards for this thing, so I'm assuming that the stakeholders have seen the value in, in that aspect of the informational order. <laughs> well, no, you, and you've had very good compliance, as I understand it, because people understand it. Uh, we, we have had compliance with the informational order, with the Delta informational order, but we also have sought information and taken enforcement action on other parties that are, some will be before the board. Uh, this item ha was uh, readopted by the board in 2015, as you know, and we are asking the board to readopt it again with slight modifications to the informational order item. The two slight modifications are 879C1C, which read, when a water right holder diverts or uses user 
responds to an investigation order, we're changing the, the, the language to fails to respond so we, so we can issue the informational orders. That's actually just clarification. Clarification. Uh, and the, the, the only other item that's being adjusted is that the, uh, the delegation authority will give the deputy director the ability to re-delegate the authority to issue informational orders to the assistant deputy director. And those are the only changes that we are proposing, but we, uh, staff recommends that the board adopts, uh, re-adopts this resolution. Thank you very much. I'm gonna quickly move this item before the stampede comes in after Mr. Hoge, Hogan's statement. <laughs> Second. Any other discussion or questions? Um, I, I actually think this has been you know, a great effort by staff and stakeholders to, to drill down and get good information to make more timely decisions. It's, I think, a great accomplishment of 2015, and um, I, I just, thanks for your work. The fact that nobody's here speaks volumes. And anecdotally, I've heard from an awful lot of folks that they think information is important, and so I think that's great. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries, thank you very much for the time and for waiting with us, and, and thank you, Mr. Rose, <laughs> for your special addition. Contribution, right? Um, next, we'll move to item number nine. That's okay with everyone? Um, Mr. Oppenheimer and Katie, Ms. Lando. Good morning, Chair Marcus, members of the board. Uh, my name is Eric Oppenheimer, and with me today is Catherine Landau. We are with the Office of Research Planning and Performance, and this item is an informational presentation of the uh, fiscal year 1415 performance report. The um, Performance report is the Water Board's web-based annual report that's organized around our key Water Board functions and responsibilities. It documents our resources and our work accomplished over the course of the year, and it also tracks the performance of our organizations by comparing uh, the work we uh, accomplish uh, at the end of the year as compared to specific targets that are set at the beginning of each year. And in addition to those functions, to a growing extent, the report is, um, it's really starting to evaluate and look at the effect of our programs and our actions on actual uh, water quality and environmental improvements, things that we call outcome-based performance measures. Um, so why do we do it? <laughs> I just needed some reaction over there. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about those outcomes and kind of where we're going with them a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and that is, you know, there's a lot of interest in that. That's really where folks want to go. Although I, I do think both are important tracking yeah. the outputs because hopefully it's those outputs that we can tie to those positive outcomes we want to see. So the report has multiple purposes, um, both internally and externally. Internally, it's a good workload tracking and planning tool and it provides a consistent and systematic method for setting priorities and tracking, um, tracking our accomplishments across our organizations. And it also helps us evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of our um, programs. Uh, it provides information that we can use to essentially to, to learn, uh, to learn uh, from what is working uh, in our programs and to replicate those things and also to, you know, figure out what's not as successful and be able to course correct and change. Um, so we don't, we continue to do the things that work and we don't continue to do the things that aren't as, as helpful and useful. Uh, externally, it's, it's a really good communication tool um, to our fee payers, 
the regulated community, NGOs, the legislature, really anybody who is interested in how we allocate our resources, what our programs, how, the, how our programs are staffed, and then what we do and accomplish with those uh, resources. And part of the goal is in being uh, transparent and providing all this information in such a comprehensive way, it helps build trust and demonstrates accountability. And in doing that, um, it helps uh, provide, uh, it, it basically helps um, build confidence in our organization and hopefully in turn that builds support for our mission and for the, for the water boards. Some key points about the report. This is the seventh year that we've been producing the report. So it's definitely starting to mature. We're starting to get better at um, predicting uh, targets or forecasting targets and following through on those. Although, as you see in some of the numbers, we'll st we still have some challenges and I expect we'll continue to have challenges over time. That's all part of the process. And although it is uh, maturing, it's also evolving and, and changing. And I expect, you know, it will never be complete. It will always be um, sort of a work in pro progress. And, um, you know, when, when Karen Turgovich and Rafa Maestu originally um, put the report out there, um, one of their key principles was we're not going to wait for perfection. We're going to use the data that we have and we're going to put it out there and improve over time. And that's really worked out well because the act of actually putting out the data and exercising all our data systems has, one, improved the completeness and the quality of our data. Uh, we've, seen we've seen significant improvements in, in data quality across most of our uh, key databases, CWIX, SMARTS, um, to name a couple. Um, and we've also, um, we've thought more about how we're going to use the data. So, you know, typically we've always been interested in how to get data into our databases. Now we're actually pulling data out and transforming it into information. So it's also made us look at our data systems and, um, and make some adjustments to, to how those systems are managed, which I think has been a key uh, benefit of the report that I don't know that we actually thought we'd see uh, when we initially set out seven years ago. Uh, I always like to mention that the report continues to be innovative in state government. I've done a lot of looking around for um, examples on what we could do differently. And, um, you know, the Water Board's really shown a lot of leadership in, in the performance report and performance management in general because um, we are, you know, really heads and tails above all other state agencies out there. No one has anything even remotely close to this report. California um, or beyond? I've looked specifically at California, but, and, you know, I can't say with complete confidence that no one has anything like this, but I haven't been able to find anything like this in another state agency. The federal government's got some pretty good performance tracking, but um, we're, we're, the scope of the information that we present, the transparency, uh, we show the good, the bad, the ugly. We put it all out there in an honest and transparent way. Uh, I don't, I haven't found anyone else doing it the same, at the same level that we are. So um, that's, you know, says a lot, I think, about our organization and our commitment to transparency and uh, accountability. Um, there's a bullet point developed internally. I always like to mention that, you know, the whole report is done internally. We like to... Um, we, we, you know, it's not the kind of thing you can hire a consultant to do. The value is, and is actually in going through the process of putting the report together, figuring out what makes the most sense to measure, setting the targets at the beginning of the year, doing the sort of closing of the books accounting at the end of the year. Again, um, you know, if we, if we were to hire someone, it just wouldn't have the same value. <laughs> uh, the report is evolving and uh, growing. Um, to some extent, we're trying to rein things in. I mean, there's this tension. You can see 223 report cards. Each report card, if you printed them out, and it's not a print report, it's completely online, but they'd probably be two or three pages each. So, 
you know, we're getting to the point now, 417 performance measures, it's a report that would be like five, six, seven hundred pages long if you were to print it out. And I think potentially we suffer a little bit from information overload. So that's one of the things that we've focused on trying to reduce some of the um, report cards that maybe aren't as valuable and take more time to produce um, than, than some of the others. Back to your point about why it's important to do it internally, because it's a guide for thinking about what we do consciously, as opposed to just keep doing what we've been doing and assuming that it's the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, it's a guide. And you know, there's an internal tension here at the boards with, with the concept of um, what we report on and what we don't report on. You know, we're, I'm personally torn because there's this um, desire by a lot of the program staff to want to report on every activity we do so we can put it out there and, and show every task that we, how hard we accomplish, work. how hard we work. Yeah, so I understand that. But um, I think it's also important that we focus on the sort of critical few, the most important functions and um, that's a challenge to pick what it is we measure because people will respond, our staff will respond to what we measure. And if we're measuring the number of permits we update, number of inspections, there's going to naturally be a focus on that. So that's, uh, that's part of the challenge is to, you know, covering everything, but also focusing on what's most important. And then um, before, you, oh, before yep. you move on, though, while I appreciate the value of, of the internal commitment and engagement, um, I would also strongly suggest that having some external stakeholder input is also valuable, as we're starting to see with the SB4 groundwater modeling criteria process. And the more I know that board member Diadamo and I have met with some stakeholders on the fees issue and have tried to engage them to participate more in terms of looking at our performance report and providing input on how, you know, that report my better serve them in terms of informing them in terms of their activities and the fees and how the resources are being used. So um, I, I think we're, we're starting to take that steps of engaging stakeholders to ensure that the performance measures that are being developed and the performance report as it evolves over time is meaningful not only to us but also to them as well. And I, I applaud that. I think that's a good direction to move towards. Thank you for bringing that up. I was going to raise that. Uh, there does seem to be some uh, stakeholders uh, are concerned it's a little bit difficult to use. So I like that idea about engaging um, uh, stakeholders um, and perhaps on you know any recommended changes they would have. But um, aside from that, just even to provide an information session on how to use the stake the, use the performance report. I think for um, those of us, I can't really include myself because I don't use it that frequently, but for those internally that are using it all the time and, and ex externally, I think it's just like any web-based program. It takes a while to get used to. And I know that there was a commitment um, by administrative services to um, provide for um, some individual um, uh, stakeholder opportunities uh, to help guide them through uh, using the performance report. That's, uh, that's helpful input. I think we're, um, I think the report now and in its seventh year of production, it's a good time to sort of look more, more externally broadly and, you know, providing um, some sessions on how, how it works and how to navigate it could be helpful, but also incorporating stakeholder input onto how to make it more uh, useful and user friendly. I just want to mention that we have at the outset of our fee stakeholder meetings for the last number of years provided kind of a, a gateway presentation into the performance report. And there's also built into the performance report, each page, each card, the home page, all have a feedback button. So if anyone ever is confused, concerned, has questions, suggestions, modifications, there's an opportunity all through the report to be able to provide that continuous feedback. And we encourage folks to use that. And that's something maybe we can um, highlight, find other ways to highlight. It's right there on the home page of the report. Um, but we um, will try to find a way to make that even more pronounced. Thanks for pointing that out. I, what I was going to mention, it relates to, to your discussion here that um, 
this is such a, it, there's so much um, ability here to answer so many questions that do come up, often during processes like fee setting and that sort of thing. And I appreciate uh, Karen pointing out that we really are trying to structure this in a, kind of a living document way, being online, um, providing this sort of real-time feedback for those that are interested in it. Because, you know, there's a difference. We do want to look at who the audience is, and I think that's changing through time. Early on, we were selling ourselves that this was important. And, you know, through seven years, as you pointed out, now we can really expand the use of this uh, tool uh, to, to answer a lot of challenges that, that we face and to demonstrate that we are walking the talk as far as accountability and transparency. So I, I love the idea of making training available, but sometimes it's, it's a solution without a problem. You know, you're going to have a hard time filling the audience if, if there isn't an, an issue at hand, like proposed fee increases and that sort of thing. So I think that was helpful for Karen to point out that, oh yes, indeed, we do showcase this information as we go through these processes. So I want to encourage, you know, obviously the state board staff, but regional board staff as well, to use this as a tool of communication uh, and uh, in terms of moving forward on our, uh, you know, wide variety of, of initiatives, both within the state board and in the regional boards, and the drinking water division is going to start hopefully using this more too. So I, it's it's there's so much here, I, you know, <laughs> um, but but sometimes it, you'll struggle with you know the solution in, in search of a problem. Um, I wonder through your process, usually things that are sustained are kind of calendared almost. So, you know, you have the annual pro performance report. Would there be value in looking at how you tee that up and if there's some sort of stakeholder component that we could expand uh, in line with what the board members are talking about today? You know, if some kind of a rollout or initiation of, of the effort, you know, have you thought about those kind of ideas to just engage folks more? Yeah, well, that's something we'll put more thought into. We really haven't thought about how, at least I haven't, about you know how to engage the stakeholders and to get get their input on it. We've you know basically been on a schedule like you like you said. Um, I guess we won't know until we try if we if we actually do like a session on you know seeking public input, and we'd probably start that session actually with a um, with a learning session where we went through a, a, a presentation on how to use it and how to access the information most effectively and then p follow up that that session with, okay, how could we make this more useful? And I guess we won't know until we try to see how much interest there is out there. I think tying it to fees would sort of build in an audience and, and an interest level. Well, one thing I forgot to mention is, you know, in the audience, you know, which one are we talking about, fee payers? Another audience is um, the federal government you know, US EPA and certain obligations we have programmatically to them. Um, you know, have, has that been useful? Uh, have we used the performance report in those um, discussions? Well, mostly with, with federal, and Katie, I don't know if you want to chime in on this, but with a, with a federal, with US EPA, uh, a lot of our work has been trying to align our reporting require, our reporting strategies with their requirements, uh, which, you know, we're getting closer to, but what we don't want to do is create reporting burden for our staff twice, basically the need to report the same information in a different format. So we've had conversations with them. We haven't come to a complete agreement as to, you know, what is the best uh, format that would satisfy both needs, but that's something that I think we'll have to come to a head um, pretty soon here. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've been working closely with the Division of Water Quality and the regional boards for to ensure that our, you know, the NPDES uh, permitting or inspection targets meet our commitments we've made to US EPA. And the majority of the conversation we've been having with US EPA has been for the TMDL program to uh, ensure that our reporting requirements are in uh, line with the US EPA vision that they've been rolling out. So just uh, speaking of public interest, last bullet here, um, Katie runs the Google Analytics on the site, and uh, I think it's pretty similar every year. We get about 17 to 20,000 unique web page visitors. I think when I looked at the report, um, plan and assess, which is where the TMDL outcome cards are, is one of the more popular uh, pages, and then the other 
popular page is targets. So that makes sense to me. I'm not surprised about that. No, you might get more hits if you can fix the widgets so that they appear on iPads. <laughs> like it's a blank page. Oh, really? Yeah, it doesn't show up on iPad, all the widgets. I thought web support was working on uh, iPad or Apple compatibility. Um, it's, been a, it's been a challenge. Um, some of it has to do with the software that we're using, and it's starting to get a little bit outdated, so we might have to make some IT investments. But um, there is a solution eight. for that, Tam. Member Dota. Uh, yeah. Don't want. I do not want to hear it. <laughs> some wouldn't call it a solution, but you guys need to make a commercial. A step back. <laughs> No, uh, my operating system if she can. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, honestly, not that I want us to invest in some major IT upgrade, but you know, I do when I'm in various meetings, attending conferences, want to whip out my iPad and showcase our performance report, and it's kind of sad. Well, point taken. I will commit to having the conversation with uh, DIT. I cannot commit that it will be fixed, but we will we will look into it. So uh, a couple new things for this year's uh, performance report, um, a couple internal things that you kind of don't see in the report and a couple external things. Um, one, uh, we've, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we've taken a hard look at some of the report cards and we've actually, we haven't eliminated them completely because they're still there in the background, but we went through with some of the program staff here at State Board and looked at the, um, array of cards we currently have, like for the regulate program primarily, for so for like NPDS, WDR, land disposal, stormwater, and then the enforcement um, program, which we've got probably those are probably the meatiest portions of the report with the most individual report cards. We went through and kind of looked at which ones take a lot of time to develop each year, but are not necessarily that helpful in the program's opinion. And we have temporarily for this year um, hidden those. So if we want to ever bring them back or if we hear from people, hey, what happened to this particular card? It was useful. We can do that in the future. Um, but we're trying to, again, focus on what's most important and most useful. So one of the nice features of the report is that it is designed to be very modular. So it's very easy to sort of take things away without having big holes and to add plug things in. Uh, we also worked uh, with some of the programs to sort of what I call distribute responsibility or ownership for aspects of the report. So instead of ORPP basically going through all of the data and um, compiling the results and then just presenting it to the programs, we've asked them to take it over and so they can go through and, uh, and calculate the results themselves. We have processes in place to verify that the data is good. Um, but in general, that's a continuing trend where we would like to uh, we'd like to move some of the responsibilities for report production off to the programs. We think one, it helps um, it helps with our workload, so we can focus on other aspects of the report. But two, uh, it gets them more involved and sort of forces them to be more involved on a periodic basis rather than just looking at things toward the end of the year. We also added performance measures for the drinking water program, and we'll show you those when we, um, we'll show you one of them anyway when we go live with the report. Uh, we added uh, performance measures. They, they, they're in the regulate portion of the, uh, of the report, and they're, they, they really um, mimic sort of what we've done with our other core regulatory programs where we're reporting on the number of inspections that were conducted at drinking water treatment facilities and the number of permits uh, that were either issued or updated at drinking water treatment facilities. Additionally, um, every year we add, um, we've, we've been adding over 20 new water quality outcome cards every year. These are the, what started as the TMDL outcome cards. They're still very much focused on TMDLs, but we've expanded that to allow for um, the regional boards to submit, to develop these report cards for other efforts that aren't necessarily TMDLs, but they can demonstrate um, a change in water uh, quality. So we've changed the title from TMDL outcome to water quality. So we've got 104 of, the, um, of these outcome cards now, and we'll go through one of them again in a few minutes. I should, I, yeah, go ahead. I should disclose that in my briefing with staff, I, I threw a challenge out at them 
with respect to outcome cause to take a crack at working with the Division uh, of Drinking Water um, as well as DFA and developing an outcome card that links to implementation of the human right to water. Um, you know, talking about, you know, it's one of the key issues that I think at some point we need to determine, and that is uh, the accessibility of safe drinking water throughout the state and see this is one of those outcome metrics that I hope we can make some progress towards developing. And, and uh, in that regard, uh, I had a meeting yesterday with uh, the staff and with OEHA, and uh, we will be having some uh, performance measures. We'll, we'll put up a human right to water uh, website with uh, some outcome cards. I, I don't know whether I'd call them outcome cards. We'll see what we call actually, them. Actually, is, is that regarding uh, the indicators that OEHA is developing? Because I actually have a request in to meet with them on it. So maybe I should meet with you guys first. Well, yeah, we are actually were working on some of the same things. And so since there was uh, overlap between what OEHA wanted to do <laughs> and what uh, we're working on, uh, you know, my suggestion to everybody, which OEHA is presently considering, is that we just combine our efforts into a single work group rather than have two separate efforts going on, which doesn't obviously make much sense, at least to me. Perfect. Um, if you could follow up with Deb, I'd like to get a briefing on that. Thank you. May not be the the right time, and I'm sorry, I didn't look at the performance report before the meeting. Uh, water recycling, do we have an op outcome card for that so we're keeping track of it? In our, on our plan and assess page, we do have a couple of cards that show uh, our water recycling goals and mandates. I don't know if I'm getting the terminology correctly, um, but um, that are tied to the recycled water policy, and then they show the actual amount of recycled water that's been realized at various uh, over over time and how that recycled water is being used for you know uh, municipal outdoor purposes or agricultural purposes the the constraint or drawback there is that it's the the last data point we have is the 2009 recycled right, water which is, survey uh, and i know there's a new survey for this year that'll be for this year and given how much we've done on financing and streamlining it, a way to get that uh, in. You all are just providing the vehicle for showing, but we, we need to have more up-to-date numbers on such an important priority. So that's why you answered my question before I asked it there, which was good. But Jonathan, do you want to add anything? That's one where I wish I had that at the touch of the button. Yes, well, um, I think it's clear from our view of the, um, the, the survey issue is that surveys are really time-consuming inaccurate and um, yeah. and um, anecdotal. And so we need a regulatory mechanism. The problem that we've had in the past with it is it's very difficult to determine how you count recycled water and to, to um, account for it. We need to figure out which way we want to do it and then impose it very similar to the reporting requirements that we've done for um, for water rights or for uh, conservation, it won't be perfect, and there will be right, problems with it. Be better. But it would be a standardized method for doing it, um, and so we are looking at different options there. But I don't have a time frame for you right now, and it will take a little bit of effort to bring that in, um, depending on what tr direction we go. Right, and, and I know that's something that uh, yeah, I'm sure water reuse and others have a common interest in us being able to report that. So maybe they'll help us. That's yeah, because they were just as unhappy with the lack of data that when I asked them, I th I thought maybe they'd have better data, but they don't. We, we we gave them a contract to do this about four years, five years ago, and they were unable. Interesting. Because there was no metrics. requirement. Yeah. No, there was no requirement. It wasn't metrics. It's so much, although metrics is is. So folks didn't want to answer the question. When you do voluntary, you get something between 40 and 60 percent. <laughs> you don't get 100 so percent. Does it make sense to amend the recycled water policy in some way? Um, I, I, I hate to just talk, you know, without um, all I mean, just, the information, but it would seem to me that, um, that looking at either the production side or the use side, what the problem is we can't do both because it won't 
match up and it and it's impossible to to segregate out when it's a wholesaler retailer or, uh, end user um so if we can you know bite the bullet and say we're going to do one just for example on the production side we can amend all of our wastewater permits and require reporting on the amount produced um it doesn't tell you where that's used um, and so you have other questions it brings up, and um, but that's one way to do it. The other way is to to set up some sort of a reporting requirement on use, um, which then you have to be very careful about if it's is this the end use or is this an intermediate use? Is this a you know it becomes I actually want to know both, but yeah. Yeah, I know, and um, also there so are that's why it's been a difficult situation. It's not a. Uh, standard requirement in our permitting structure today we need to figure out where to insert that and um and that's where we are There's sorry for the digression but i couldn't good, though, i couldn't I, resist i'm <laughs> glad you brought it up i mean in, and in use it's interesting because um reporting use is it can be a disincentive to getting more recycling done you know it, however small it may seem it's it's part of the discussion I, I have a question. Uh, we had a presentation, an informational presentation, I don't know, four months ago, three or four months ago, on a Lean Six Sigma. Was that, is that it? Is that, did I remember it right? Yes, you um, did. And it seems to me that there they were uh, trying to in, improve performance in the actual collecting of the information. And how does that link up with what you're reporting on here, or does it? Well, it's starting to. Um, in, and, and specifically in the Division of Water Quality, where they've um, launched a, a few different Lean Six Sigma analyses. Um, you know, working with DWQ and, and Vicki Whitney, um, she's always, you know, basically questioned the, the the previous suite of performance targets for the division just because they don't operate the same way as like a region. They're not like, you know, in in a production mode in terms of getting out a high volume of permits. They do big statewide permits and provide guidance. So the targets that we had for them were never really a, a great fit. And Vicki, you know, expressed concern. And to her credit, this year she's um, her and her staff have developed a new suite of targets that are actually tied more toward, they're tied directly actually to their Lean Six Sigma efforts where their targets now are number of dates to achieve certain milestones for all of, or for a handful of their high profile, most important key projects. So we're starting to see that linkage. I think that could be expanded and, and, and used more. Um, but at least that's a that's a first step in that direction. That's great to bring up. I know in our briefing we talked about that too, um, transitioning the report not in just terms of output, but actual performance in, in terms of customer service or responsiveness and, and these other elements of the Lean Six Sigma process. So I'm going to hand it over to Katie to talk a little bit about the results. So as Eric mentioned, at the beginning of each fiscal year, the regional and state board uh, divisions offices um, s set targets for uh, key workloads. And then at the end of the fiscal year, we uh, determine how much of the, you know, what workload was actually completed. And we compare to see how well we, um, we estimate, predicted our workloads. So this graph shows uh, for three, our three categories, our inspections, our permitting, and all other, that would be things such as TMDLs or basin plan amendment adoptions, enforcement activities, and your cleanup activities, as well as um, funding for the state board, uh, how well we've, uh, we've met our targets. So for, you know, this is showing for the, in the dark blue, the 14, 15 targets, so that's what we set in June of 2014 and accomplished by June 30th, 2015. And in the light blue, the same for the 13-14 fiscal year and in the gray for the 12-13 the fiscal year. So this means, for example, um, statewide, we 
met 79% of the inspection targets that we set at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, you can see over the last three years, we've seen a general improvement in our ability to, to meet the targets that we've established um, with the 79% of inspection targets met, 70% of our permitting targets met, and um, a little lower, the all other, the 66% of um, all other targets met. We typically hope to see a slightly, uh, we, we see a slightly higher uh, achievement in the inspection targets, primarily because those are normally a shorter term project. Uh, it's a more def definite workload. You can, you know, you plan your inspection, you plan your, your monitoring report review. And so it's a, it's a shorter timeline, so it's easier to plan and meet that uh, target within a one year time period. Things such as permitting or especially in the all other where you're doing things with your stakeholder outreach like your, your TMDLs, your other projects um, are going to be a little bit more difficult. They're a longer term. They can, you know, resources may be reallocated due to changing priorities such as you know, the drought activities or you get a stakeholder involvement and that will may push your, you know, the, the adoption of something into the next fiscal year. So, you know, the general process is that we're seeing an improvement in our targets. Uh, for 1415, we would have hoped to see the inspections a little higher because that is a shorter term process. We do, our, our hope is that we are always in the mid 80s. We're a little lower this year. Um, so it shows that for statewide, there's, there's room for improvement. But the goal of, of the performance management approach is not always to hit 100%. If we hit 100% across the board, that would actually indicate that we're not um, we're not striving to, you know, we're not properly using all of our allocated resources. Um, and on the same process as Eric mentioned, actually going through the process of setting the targets is valuable. It's, it makes us look at our, you know, our existing data or what, what are we prioritizing. Um, and at the same time, it's equally important to understand why we may not have met the targets. Um, as we'll see on the next slide, there is variability in the regions. And one of the things um, we're committing to in ORPP is actually now that the performance report is out, is to follow up with uh, the various programs to see, you know, for example, why the inspection targets weren't as high as we uh, were planning to, to see them this year. If I went into the report, would I be able to see what the targets actually were? So that you could see that the let's say that the um, number was higher, but the targets were lower. Not necessarily good or bad, but there's there's more there's a story behind all of this. Yes. So we will actually move into a live demonstration of our of the performance report in a couple minutes, and we can show you where that is. Um, for you know the regions, if you look at that, so this is the the targets achieved by the organization. So our nine regional boards and uh, the state board there at the the right hand side. And if you looked at the targets pages for any of these regions, you would see potentially that you know they had planned to adopt uh, one TMDL and they actually adopted four or something, you know something like that where, they may exceed a target that they set by a significant uh, actual workload, um, but we, we show that they fit that target. So if they hit seven of 10 targets, they would show a 70% here. Um, there's, as you can see, there's significant variability uh, region to region. It's not our intention uh, to compare regions across the board because every region, you know, is slightly different. Resources are different. Uh, regional considerations or, you know, projects are different. But something that can be seen in this is uh, a region, uh, Los Angeles region or region four as it's shown here, uh, has really taken performance management to heart. And you can see this in their numbers. Um, They've been doing, their management has been doing monthly check-ins with their various programs uh, and following up with us to ensure that they are on track to meet their annual targets. 
Um, and that's, you know, in 13, 14, they were able to achieve 91% of their targets. And they've actually were able to improve that in uh, the 14, 15 fiscal year, uh, achieving 96% of their targets. So it really highlights uh, how useful performance management can be as a, as a you know, program management tool. Um, but as I said, you know, it's, again, it's not always our goal to hit 100%. The other major component of this is that reconsideration aspect. And uh, we, the regions and the state board divisions and offices are provided an opportunity to, you know, do that uh, evaluation at the end and see, you know, maybe why they didn't hit their, their targets. So for example, uh, San Diego region or region nine on this graph, uh, they saw a, a reduction. They didn't hit as many of their targets this year, but their staff took the time to uh, evaluate all of their targets and that their um, explanation of why maybe they didn't hit everything is actually included on their, uh, their regional board targets page. So uh, Katie's going to um, load up the live report and we'll show you just a short demonstration on it. This table is a, it's kind of a nice summary because it's uh, just absolute uh, numbers in terms of work accomplished across three fiscal years. So you can just see number of facilities, number of permits issued, inspections, reports reviewed, uh, enforcement actions that we took, TMDLs that were adopted and then um, funding that or SRF funding that we've allocated. One caveat on the chart is it looks like we had a really big jump in activity this year, and we did, but um, a, a big portion of that is attributable to uh, bringing the drinking water program in, which is now captured in these results for 14, uh, 15. Um, but you know, if you look at like the Clean Water State Revolving Fund uh, allocations, uh, that's you know just the sort of water board without the drinking water funding because that's shown on a separate line item at 117 million. There's been you know a very consistent increase in uh, funding allocated, which I think reflects the work of the Division of Financial Assistance. And across um, most of the programs, the um, level of work is either increasing or at least uh, stable. Uh, one notable exception is the uh, TMDL program where, uh, you know, we, we were around 12 to 14 each year, and then this year there appears to be somewhat of a drop off. Hopefully that will rebound next year. I think some of it's related to the program actually implementing some of the TMDLs uh, that have already been adopted. So uh, unless there's questions on the table, uh, we'll turn it over to Katie for a moment. And I'll just, while she's loading it, mention that the report um, went live today. So the links have all been, or hopefully have all been updated. Uh, and Katie will show you how you get to the report. I'll just try and stand up. Um, so if you go to the waterboards.ca.gov uh, homepage or any of the regional board homepages, on the, the left-hand side of the website, we've got this blue column, and there is the performance report. It's the green button, and you click on that, and it is live to take you to the 14, <laughs> for the 14, 15 uh, performance report homepage where you can, on non-Apple products, see the our, our statewide uh, widget shows that we, uh, uh, achieve 72% of our, our targets for across the entire agency. This is consistent with what we um, achieved in the 13-14 uh, fiscal year as well. So as Eric mentioned earlier, the performance report is laid out by function. So we have uh, six, seven tabs here. The first six are focusing on our, our various uh, performance measure functions. Um, and we'll walk through a couple of these. But then the last one that um, everyone's normally concerned about is the targets, which is that last uh, tab. And as uh, Karen mentioned earlier, we do have uh, an op opportunity for uh, feedback from, on every single page. And these are gonna be via that the screen feedback button that you'll find on the top right-hand corner of every single page of our performance report. 
It's green, it's environmental. It, So um, well, I'll hand it back over to Eric so he can walk you through the first uh, tab, which is our, our plan and assess. Why don't you scroll down to the, uh, the outcome cards and let's just uh, go right directly to the team deal implementation outcomes and scroll up a little for me, Katie. Uh, the other way, sorry, I guess down a little bit more. Um, so what this, what this shows is sort of like the big picture overview of the TMDLs and water quality outcome cards that we've uh, uh, completed so far. So um, not every one of these cards is, it corresponds to a TMDL, as I mentioned earlier, but most of them do. And um, you can see by region how many TMDLs have been adopted to date, and in total it's 194. And of the 194, we've... Uh, um, done these um, TMDL outcome cards or evaluated the, the um, you know, how we're doing in implementing the TMDLs on 46% or 89 different uh, TMDLs. And for each one, as you'll see on the cards, for each card, we sort of have, have a, a grading system that we've developed with the TMDL program. And the grades are, if you scroll down a little bit, um, and there's guidance on how to, you know, how to, they're a little subjective, but we do have guidance on the card on how to, do the grading, but basically the, the scores are, you know, success in the green, target achieved, and we've delisted the water body, or uh, the light green is conditions are improving, uh, but we haven't yet met the target, uh, but also, but a positive trend. And then the, in the red and yellow, we've got two categories, improvement needed. Um, we basically need a course correction or maybe more time for implementation. And then probably the one that concerns me the most is data inconclusive. We just don't um, have the data to determine if the TMDL is being effective or not. And it's always interesting to me that, you know, as the data set grows, um, this breakdown continues to be about 50-50, where half the cards fall into the, you know, what I call the good category of, you know, either we've delisted the water body or conditions seem to be going in the right direction, and then half fall into the um, needs improvement or data inconclusive category. And then if you scroll down further on the page, you can get to the each of the 89 individual uh, performance cards. And why don't you just click on the um, medals? And yeah, that one's a good one to show. Let's see if that comes up. There we go. These are PDFs, so they're a little bit different, but that just is the best format for them. So all these cards, they're not all identical, but they're as close to identical and consistent as we can make them. And they all start with this similar sort of header at the top that describes, you know, what the TMDL is for or what the which what pollutant is being addressed and where, how it's being implemented. In this case, it's uh, metals and Los Cerritos channel. Uh, it's implemented through permits, essentially, and, and waivers. Uh, the TMDL was effective in 2010, and the attainment was expected in 2026, or is expected. One of the things we added are those check boxes on the right side that show, you know, what is the pollutant uh, type. And this information we added because what we wanted to do when we've done, and this will help us do it better in the future, is look at these cards collectively and figure out, like I said earlier, what are the approaches that we're using that are working, and what types of pollutants are we more successful at, which ones are more challenging for us. Um, so the information is here, and I expect that these will, um, the information that we collect will, will grow as we try to, you know, evaluate are things working. We're going to look at it and say, huh, if we had only added this piece of information, we'd have a better understanding. So it's sort of an iterative adaptive process here, both with figuring out what the effects, how the TMDLs are working and our approaches that work, as well as what information is important to capture. Each one's got a um, short brief description of the TMDL itself or the water quality improvement strategy. Uh, and then there's usually, or there's always a link to the full TMDL for more information, just a location map. If you scroll down further, there's a, on this one, there's a small chart that shows the TMDL waste load allocations compared to the actual copper loading. So you can get a sense of what's going on in terms of loading compared to the um, allowable loading. So in this case, it's showing, you know, we're still above the allowable loading um, levels in a number of instances. And there's bullet points on water quality outcomes that have occurred as a result of implementing the TMDL. 
or whatever strategy it is that we're implementing. And then typically each one ends with actual water quality in the receiving water. So in this case, we see the uh, numeric target from the TMDL for total lead compared to the receiving water uh, quality data results. And uh, you know, in this case, it's uh, fairly uh, promising in that most of the results are below the, uh, below the target, so that's a good thing. So with that, why don't you, unless there's questions, why don't you go back, Katie, and show, you could maybe go to the regulate and walk through that quickly and show the drinking water. So um, as you can see on this page, it's similarly laid out to the plan and assess homepage where we've got um, some summary information on the right hand side on the, the number, you know, what the regulated community is that we're looking at. Um, this is some, these are the same numbers that Eric had in the summary statistics table. Uh, one thing we do have on the regulate is that this, uh, this dashboard is interactive. So you can see that of the, the 31,000 facilities that we regulate statewide, they're actually broken down into uh, these various uh, regulatory uh, categories. So our NPDES wastewater, our WDR, stormwater. Um, and new to the State Water Board this year is the Division of Drinking Water, which you can see we have over you know 7,600 uh, facilities statewide. So if you click on the, this, uh, the facilities regulated, it will pop up a new uh, drinking water uh, column graph which shows in the, the, uh, in the green the number of systems broken down into two types. They're the, the community water systems and the non-community water systems. These are the divided by this, the size of the, the systems. Um, as well as the uh, the public water systems that we at the in the division of drinking water uh, are responsible for responsible for for permitting um, of the three thousand uh, community water systems, for example, we uh, performed eight hundred and seventy six inspections uh, in the fourteen fifteen fiscal year shown in this blue column here. And if you click on this, it will take you to the individual page to learn more about the uh, that performance measure. Um, this is similar to the, the TMDLs uh, or the water quality outcome summary page that we were looking at. All of the performance report pages follow the same uh, layout where we've got some key statistics on the top. It tells you what measure you're, you're looking at. And we do uh, present all of the data in uh, both as a tabular, as a graphic, and in a, uh, a narrative uh, layout because people do assimilate information in different ways. Uh, the Division of Drinking Water has uh, five regional offices that are, that are different than the, the water quality control board regions we've been used to for the last several decades. So in addition to that, because the uh, drinking water is a new program, we do also include a map so people uh, know what regions are in what part of the state. Uh, not only do we present the, you know, the explanation of what was achieved in the fiscal year, we do also do a, a brief description of why the measure is important, why, you know, what key aspects of the program management is it indicating, um, and our, our technical background information. So we have access, if someone, a, a stakeholder was interested, they could go directly to the program's page or access, uh, you know, they wanted to see where those, where those inspections occurred, they could access the uh, data directly. Additionally, we do, on every page, we do have this glossary section that gives those uh, basic definitions for uh, those who may not be familiar with every uh, program at the State Water Board. So how about the uh, target pages, and we'll wrap it up from there. But as you can see, there's a, there's just a huge amount of information on in this report. And before, I, um, I guess as Katie's doing that, I have a, a suggestion. If it's you might have already thought of this, but um, at the next 
transition committee meeting for the drinking water program, I suggest you present um, the drinking water section of the performance report and perhaps get their feedback on it if you haven't done it already. I have not, so that's a good suggestion. So this is the uh, target tab on the report and uh, it, it opens up with a map of the state and if you click on the map um, for an individual region, you get their individual targets. It's got these slider bar widgets uh, you know, that present the same information that we showed you earlier in the, in the presentation that, we, that, we, um, that, we, that we've been doing. Why don't you just click on region uh, four since they are the uh, highlight region in terms of targets met. So it opens up a page, shows a, another slider that's specific to the region. In this case, 96% of their targets met. It breaks out their targets by that same breakout permitting inspections and others. They were at 100, 190. Uh, the way that the 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 way the math works, I don't know if it's math, but the way the classification system works, uh, if you if you get more than 80% of what you said you were going to do, you're considered have met your target. Uh, and then there's, you know, the other colors are shown there between 60 and 80 is, is yellow and below 60% is, is red, which, you know, it's not what we want to see. Fewer red dots, the better. But Chair Mark is getting to your question. So what we've got here, if you scroll down a little bit, for each program, it shows the specific target. So pollutant water body combinations addressed, number of TMDLs adopted, basin plan amendments adopted. It shows what their target was. It shows what their actual achieved was, and also importantly, it shows for this program within this region what their budget was and how many staff they have. So we've got this information for every region, every program, the state board, and uh, very transparent. These targets were set at the beginning of the year. They're not changed throughout the fiscal year to make it easier to meet the targets. Uh, it's all here. If you scroll down, uh, to the bottom, there's a breakout of the of the budget for this region by program for anyone who's interested in that, as well as a breakout um, on revenue sources for each program, whether it's fees or general funds or other uh, sources. And then again, in the um, in the spirit of showing the information in different ways, we've got a bar chart, and I think there's also a pie chart. So I know it's a lot of information that we've you know put up there uh, at at one time. I would encourage the you know folks in the audience and people listening to explore the report. Uh, there's a lot of great information there just on what we do, um, not only you know related to performance but describing our programs. Last thing I'll just touch on, and we've already talked about a lot of this, is next steps. Um, Tom mentioned that we're going to be developing the drinking water outcome uh, program cards. That will be a nice addition, I think an important addition. I already mentioned this goal to start increasing the turnover of the, what I call the care and feeding of some of these report cards to the actual programs to build a, a sense of ownership. And I also think importantly, uh, we need to continue to work with management to you know, really get them to use this as a management tool, much like they're doing in Region 4. Their executive officer, Sam Unger, has made it clear to their staff that the performance report is important, and, you know, they look at where they are periodically throughout the year, and if they get behind, they figure out ways to get back on track if they can. So we'd like to see, you know, that type of approach expanded, of course. Um, we, we think it would be helpful. Uh, one of the things, you know, Katie talked about was kind of going back now and looking at, well, how could we improve things? And I'd like to do that, especially with respect to uh, the inspection targets. We saw that dip this year in, the, in, the, in how we uh, met our inspection targets. Uh, we, I think we went from 85 to 70 something. I'd like to drill down into that and figure out why it was that that happened, because I, I think we should be able to you know, get our inspection targets above that 80% threshold. I think that would be a good long-term goal for the, for the water boards. And then uh, we also want to go back. We did this, it was probably a year, maybe two years ago. We went back and we did an analysis and brought it to MCC on all of the TMD outcome cards and what we learned from it. I think now that we've got probably 40 more since we did that, it would be a good opportunity now to go back and re do a similar analysis. I think it was helpful and bring that to MCC so we can basically uh, present our findings and 
that pretty much covers it. I think the one critical thing is acknowledgements. You know, Katie and I are the people up here presenting this thing, but we had a huge amount of help on this. Uh, Grant Thornton is a new environmental scientist in ORPP. He's done a lot of the lifting on this, as well as Jarma Bennett. Uh, she took over a lot of the work that Rafa was doing on um, calculating the, the results for the regulate page and um, crunching the flat file, what we call the flat file data. She did a phenomenal job, uh, as did uh, Matt Buflabin in the Office of Enforcement. He pretty much took complete ownership of the enforcement page, uh, did a great job. We got a tremendous amount of help from Ben Henningberg in Division of Water Quality for the uh, site cleanup DOD and UST cards. He sort of heard the cats with all of the um, different players and um, made sure that the results were accurate and that there was buy-in on the results from uh, the regional boards in terms of those cleanup and UST measures. And then uh, the people we probably pester the most for the bane of their existence is uh, web support, specifically Susan Kelly and Robert Anderson, and really all of web support. But uh, they've just done a phenomenal job, and we must have sent them you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of web request updates. So uh, much appreciation to all those, all those folks and, the peop and you know, all the regional board staff. It's, it's a lot of work to put this together, and it requires really a lot of different people working together. And this year was, was, a, was very smooth. So with that, if there's any questions. Um, one question, and actually I'll start first though with a request to my fellow colleagues uh, for those of us who serve as liaisons to the regional water boards. I would request that in your next attendance at the regional board meeting in your report to mention the performance report now that it's, it's live and released and offer um, should any of the regional board wish to have staff come and present. I mean, that's one way, I think, to try to engage them as well as to send the message of the importance of the performance report. And then my, my question to you, Eric, and perhaps you've mentioned this and I've just just forgotten. To what extent are the roundtables engaged in this? I'm going to be meeting with the TMDL roundtable, I believe, Thursday. And when I met with them last year, we briefly discussed this, and I asked them what value they um, have found in the TMDL outcome report cards. And I, well, let's just say there was some debate, and I encourage them to work with ARP to make the, 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 the outcome report cards more meaningful to them. So I'm curious, to what extent has there been engagement with not just the TMDL roundtable, but we have an MPDS roundtable, we have also at the roundtable, um, and to what extent have they been engaged? Yeah, so specifically uh, with, the, with the TMDL roundtable, um, I think there's growing acceptance for the and actually, I think they're starting to really like it for the TMDL outcome cards, you know, the ones that show the progress on implementing the TMDLs. They are a lot of work for the regions, and they take time to produce, and we recognize that, and that's why we're sort of phasing them in. Um, we're asking for three per region per year, so we're trying to phase them in um, somewhat slowly. Um, but Katie and Grant and uh, myself, to a more limited extent, have worked quite closely with the TMDL roundtable and other roundtables, but specifically with the TMDL roundtable to make changes. A lot of the changes to the cars that I talked about um, with, the, with the TMDL outcome cars, those check boxes and things, those are a result of our um, dialogue with, with the roundtable. They've also uh, made significant changes to, which we didn't show you, but to their outcome card. So we want to work with the roundtables and, and make sure we're capturing information and presenting in a way that's useful. I think there's probably more work we can do. And Katie's um, also been working more recently with them because of this new change in direction that EPA is going. I think they're also interested, again, in aligning what we're doing with what EPA is EPA is doing. We work, you know, in, in prior years, we've probably met more frequently with more of the roundtables, especially when we were developing cost factors and defining the tasks for each program. But we do, you know, on occasion, fairly routinely uh, meet and, and attend uh, the program roundtables, mostly WDR, NPDS, TMDL. Um, this year, it's, our time has been a little bit more limited, so we've had a, you know, not we haven't interfaced as much as I'd like to see us, but we're starting to do that more. We just met with the WDR roundtable. We went through the results with them. 
again, Katie is um, very active and Grant with the with the TMDL roundtable. So it's an area where we can where we can continue to build on and improve. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm extremely pleased at how the performance report has evolved over time. I remember there was a time when we as an organization feared having this kind of information made publicly available. Um, and so it's great to, to see the transition over time, and it's great to see you, Karen, Katie, and others now, um, you know, committing such time and expertise to this. I truly believe it is a useful tool for all of us, as well as our stakeholders. So I look forward to see how this continue to evolve um, in the next year. Thank you, board awesome. member Dota. It's, you know, your leadership's been key to this, and and as we discussed earlier, it's the, I, th I think we're only tapping into how useful this information is, and, and, and in terms of and engaging folks more, you know, the public more into into the really the you know, our our task, our shared task to protect water resources, and this helps. Awesome job. Oh. Yeah, th thank you. And thank you. It's really, it's beautiful too, which is nice. No, it just helps. It's user friendly that way. Not on an iPad. Except on an iPad. Yeah, that's all right. Work on that. Oh, it's really impressive. I know it's a massive amount of work, but um, thank you. This was a great presentation on it. Very Thanks. helpful and illuminating. I thank the rest of you for all the hard work. It's great. At item number 10, board member report. I'd like to turn to my colleagues for anything they'd like to update us on. Yes, on uh, November 18th to 19th, I attended the North Coast Regional Board meeting. Uh, and uh, so it was a two-day meeting, a lot of items. One item in terms of transparency and I thought process that I appreciated and would recognize is had an ongoing uh, issue with the Elk River and its historic, um, you know, sediment challenges related to timber harvesting by Pacific Lumber Company and all that, and uh, and hard-fought um, regulatory um, program development there, and uh, so there's a lot of progress there. But one of the things that uh, innovations I appreciated was that not only were they rolling out potential uh, TMDL language, basin plan language, but also a permit that would implement the TMDL. So it was actually a draft permit, fairly well um, researched, worked with stakeholders, and it, I thought it really helped the discussion about the TMDL um, basin plan amendment to have an articulation of the implementation tool for it that would be um, you know, ascribed to the, the companies that are putting their best foot forward to evolve in the last couple decades the, the practice of timber harvesting in the Redwood area there. And so, you know, hats off to the North Coast region for uh, getting doing the homework to make uh, a productive hearing in a difficult environment. So. One item which I will link to a request to uh, staff, Tom, I guess, in particular, um, Gita Kapahi and I, along with uh, Gabriel, whose last name I can't remember now from OCC. What is his last name? Monroe. Monroe. Thank you very much. Uh, as, as well as Lori Oaken, have had several meetings with uh, some of our EJA stakeholders to discuss the human right to water and potentially a board resolution with some guidance in terms of how we would go about considering the human right to water in our various activities. Um, it's been a while since we've had a discussion on that, and I want to make sure that it doesn't fall off the radar screen. In particular, I would like to request that, uh, if necessary, we revisit and do additional outreach to other stakeholders and hopefully get this to the board sometime in January or early February before we get too immersed in other things. Yes, I was just reviewing the draft of it yesterday, and my understanding is that it will be heard by the board in January, but I will double check and send you an email as to... Excellent. Thank you. Day. And if there's any additional stakeholder discussions that uh, need to be done, I'm willing, happy, and eager to volunteer. Thank you. 
uh, one report uh, that I met with Beverly Hills, and uh, they um, and and it, because we had the the uh, conservation presentation today, I've already said a few things that that I learned from that meeting. But uh, they have done the sh the easy things, and they have gone to one day a week watering and all all the easy stuff. But their numbers are still high, and so they're going to have to go go deeper and uh, and more targeted to those high in you know high end users, and they they know it. They're going to do it. It's just uh, it, it's a it's a good lesson for all of us that um, while it looks like you know an, one approach is going to be quite helpful, and it is broadly, but individually uh, sometimes that, that we, we need to do more. And so uh, I, I can report that Beverly Hills is uh, doing more and is uh, planning to do even more. So I expect the, their numbers to get better. Great. I, I don't have anything in particular. Thank you for all that. I'll, I'll be, I guess I'll, I'll be the only one at Aqua this week on Thursday for a uh, town hall on the water conservation regs, which I think will be something of a listening session, because I think we'll, there'll be a lot of input um, for folks who maybe will or won't be here on the 7th, uh, and then a, just a drought panel with a variety of different stakeholders. So I'll report on that if anything pops up that's new or anything that seems useful. Great. All right. So item number 10. Item number 11. And so that leaves us with closed session. Um, the board will only be meeting in closed session today on the second item on the closed session agenda, and that is the Division of Water Rights item concerning license 659 and the proposed revocation of that license belonging to the Morongo Band of Mission Indians. Uh, the closed session is authorized by government code section 11,126 subdivision C3. It is the board's pleasure whether you would like to grab a bite to eat. I do not anticipate an extended um, closed session or whether you'd like to get the closed session over with and then conclude your day, at, at least in the public meeting. Okay. We'll see you in closed session in a few moments to get staff downstairs.